you are now. Uh, Andreu, is that right? Vale. Eh, Joao Luis, can you share, start sharing your uh, slides? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Is it working? Yes, it's working. Just let me do something. Have you seen us? Okay, very good. I see people in the room. Okay, very good. Come back here. Yeah. Okay, so we we still have two minutes before starting. Good morning, everyone, in the seminar room. Okay. So, jo, Luis, if you are ready, can you share your, your camera so we can see you? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Done. Okay, very good. So, uh, it's time to start the session. <clears throat> so, welcome uh, everybody here online and uh, at the seminar room in the Theoretical Physics Department. Uh, today is the third day of this workshop, it's the final uh, session and uh, to start with it we have uh, an excellent young researcher coming from Lisbon who is currently working as a postdoc uh, at the University of Tartu in Estonia. Uh, he's Joao Luis Rosa and he's going to uh, tell us about observational characteristics of bosonic stars at the Galactic Center. So, Joao Luis, uh, you can start whenever you, you are. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks for this email inviting me to present my work here. It's a pleasure to be here again after one year. So, I'm going to present the work I've been carrying with, uh, in collaboration with Professor Peter Cardoso from Lisbon, Professor Paul Garcia from Porto, and Frederic Vincent from the, the Observatory of Paris. And uh, the objective of this work is to verify what happens if one substitutes the black hole in the center of a galaxy, for example, our own galaxy, with a bosonic star. What are the differences in the observations? So I know we were supposed to make these presentations with uh, some paper on archive or some handwritten notes, but point number one, this is still not on the archives. And point number two, there's a lot of images I wanted to show, so I decided to go for the good old slideshow just uh, uh, to make it easier to show the pictures. So let me motivate the work uh, first really quick. So we have a lot of observations today that show that objects behaving like black holes exist. For example, the orbits of the S2 star in the center of our galaxy are consistent with the predictions for a central black hole in, the, in our galaxy. And also more recently, we have the observations from the Event Horizon Telescope 
of a black hole shadow in galaxy M87. And again, these observations are pretty well described by the predictions of general relativity. Now, the problem is that even though black holes seem to be supported by these observations, we know that black holes have fundamental problems like singularities and event horizons. And since we do not have an answer to how to solve these problems, it would be very nice if we had some kind of alternative to the black hole that could reproduce the same observations and still solve the problems of not having singularities and not having event horizons. Now, the problem is that if we are using observations like the orbit of the S2 star, this star is orbiting very far from the center at uh, the rate is like a thousand times the mass of, uh, of the black hole. So in principle, even if you choose a different central object than a black hole, the metric at these distances would be more or less the same as the metric of a black hole. So these observation on the left cannot be used to constrain alternative models to, to compact objects. Shadows can be used to do that. And more recently, there was this observation of infrared flares near the center of our galaxy at radii of the order of 8.57 and 10 m. And of course, again, we are very close to the center. In principle, if we replace the central black hole with an alternative compact object, it would be possible to have some differences in the metric, some observable differences that could constrain these extra, this alternative models for, for exotic compact objects. So in this work, we are interested in bosonic stars. In particular, we are interested in two types of bosonic stars. The first one is the boson star, the scalar boson star, which is a solution of a, of a self-gravitating complex scalar field minimally coupled to, to general relativity. And the second one is the, the Proca star. And the Proca star is pretty much the same, but instead of having a complex scalar field, we have a complex vector field, again, minimally coupled to, to general relativity. These are the two simplest theories one can use. Notice that we have the kinetic term for the scalar field and the kinetic term for the vector field, but the potential, it's simply a mass term, both in the scalar field and the vector field. There are more complicated, complicated theories that can be used. For example, one can consider terms of a power four in the scalar field and the vector field, but in here, to make it as simple as possible, just to test the basics, we consider a scalar field and a vector field for which the potential is simply a mass term, of course, if one can, if one wants, one can all, always go to more complicated things, but to start, let's consider the simplest possible. So the equations of motion for the scalar field and for the vector field are given by the Klein-Gordon equation here and by the Proca equation here. And now what we have to do is to choose a metric. For simplicity, we choose a spherically symmetric metric and we obtain the solutions both for the metric and for the scalar and the vector field. And we want these solutions to be localized. So what does it mean to be localized? It means two things. First thing, it means that they are regular at the origin. So unlike black holes, there is no singularity. And second thing, it means that the solution must decay exponentially at large radii to guarantee that the scalar field or the vector field, they are limited to a, to a finite region of the space-time. And this, this is precisely what we are looking for. So how do we do that? We choose a metric that is spherically symmetric and static for simplicity. So here it is. The metric depends on two independent functions, the GTT and the GRR. We choose some appropriate ansatz for the fields, in this case, the harmonic ansatz for the scalar field and for the vector field, and we compute the solutions. Now, the field equations and the equations for the scalar field and the vector field, so the Klein-Gordon and the Proca equations, they will be a system of coupled differential equations. So when you solve for the vector field or you solve for the scalar field, you are at the same time solving for the metric, for the two components of the metric, the GTT and the GRR. So when you find your solution, you have everything you need to start uh, making comparisons with the black hole case. So let me show you first the solutions for the scalar field and the vector field. Here on the left, we have the solutions for the scalar field. So this uh, parameter gamma is the density of the scalar field and gamma zero is the central density. And we see that depending on the central density that you choose, the central density is a free parameter, depending on the central density that you choose, your uh, distribution of scalar field will be more or less compact. For example, if you choose 0 0.4 for the central density in arbitrary units, you will get a solution for a scalar field for a self-gravitating boson star with a radius of approximately r equals 8m, where m is the total mass of the scalar field, of the, the distribution of scalar field. But if you choose, for example, gamma zero, the central density equals 0 0.12 in the same unit, you will find a solution with a radius of more or less r equals 20m. 
So depending on the central density you choose, you will have more or less compact scalar, uh, scalar boson stars and vector boson stars. The solution for uh, the time component of the vector field is pretty much the same qualitatively. And the solution for the, uh, the radial component of the vector field is also very similar, but it goes like this. So again, this F0 corresponds to the density, the central density of the vector field. And again, for different values of the central, central density, you will have solutions for the vector field with different compactnesses. So you can basically choose the radius and the mass, the compactness of your boson star or your vector boson star, your Proca star, just by tuning the value of the central density of the scalar field. And then you can start making comparisons. So let me show you what happens to the metric. So in here on the left, we have the GTT and the GRR component of the metric in comparison to the black hole. So this thin black line corresponds to the black hole solution. And as you can see, these solutions are regular. They do not diver diverge at the origin like it happens for the black hole. They are always finite. And depending again on the value you choose for the central density of the scalar field, you will have a different central value for, for the GTT. And, uh, at some radius, these solutions become pretty much indistinguishable from the, the black hole. And this is what I was telling before. If you are very far from the center, it doesn't matter if you choose a boson star or a Proca star or a, or a black hole, the solutions will be more or less the same. So if you want to test if this object can be a boson star or a Proca star, you will have to go to distances closer to the center where, for example, you can study shadows or these infrared, infrared flares. This, is, this was the point I was telling you before. For the Proca star, well, the situation is more or less the same. All the solutions are regular all the way up to the center. There's no uh, singularity. And again, we see that for uh, radii larger than a certain value, these solutions become vi virtually indistinguishable from, from black holes, which is exactly what we want. So now we can start making comparisons. And there are many things we can compare with observations. I am working with Paulo Garcia and Frederick Vincent. They are members of the Gravity Collaboration. The gravity is an instrument of the European Southern Observatory in Chile. And uh, what we are doing, or what they are doing actually, because I'm not part of the collaboration yet, what they are doing is to observe the center of our galaxy and taking uh, different kinds of observations. One of the observations they do is, for example, for the orbital period, they do magnitudes, they do centroids of the observation, et cetera, et cetera. So our objective here is to try to find what would be the observation characteristics of uh, gravity if in the center of the, our galaxy there was a boson star or a Proca star instead of a black hole. And then afterwards we can make this comparison with the observations. So the first thing we want to, to compare with the experiments is the orbital motion. So first of all, uh, I have here a plot of the orbital, uh, orbital velocity of an object going around the a central boson star. And on the bottom plot, I have the, um, <clears throat> the differences in the orbital periods normalized to the orbital period of the Schwarzschild black hole, again, for boson stars with different radii. So this radii here for these four different central densities, the radii, the radii are 8m, 12m, 15m, and 20m. So we have four boson stars with different compactnesses, and the same thing for the Proca stars. And we can compare what are the orbital velocities and what are the orbital uh, periods for objects orbiting a central boson star or Proca star instead of a central black hole. And again, we see more or less what's, what's expected. If we are very close to the center, we see differences, and these differences are big enough to be observable. But if you are very far from the center, then in principle, as you expect, the differences between the orbital periods and the orbital velocities of boson stars and Proca stars compared to the black hole become so small that they are covered by the experimental errors. So you can use, if we measure, and they did, if they measure the orbital periods of this uh, infrared flares around the central, the central of, our, of our galaxy, we can use this to impose constraints on the density, on the compactness of boson stars and Proca stars. And this is precisely one of the things we want to do. And this is the theoretical background behind it. Now, another thing uh, I want to show you is uh, what are the differences if you take one one object, one isotropically emitting star, for example, and you put this orbit, uh, this object orbiting a central boson star or central Proca star, what are the differences if you take, for example, a, a black hole and a, and a boson star? Because there are differences. And in here, I'm going to show you three different types of orbits. 
So in the first panel here, you have an isotropically emitting sphere orbiting a boson star. In here, the same thing for a Proca star. And in here, the same thing for the Schwarzschild black hole. The orbital radius is R equals 8m. And the masses, the radius and the masses of this boson star and the Proca star is R equals 9m for both the boson star and the Proca star. I choose R equals 9m not arbitrarily because uh, R equals 9m corresponds to the boson star that is the most compact possible without becoming unstable. So the most compact boson star you can have that is still stable against perturbations is the boson star with the radius R equals 9m. So if you want to compare something with a black hole, you want to take the most compact possible. But since there is this limit, this bound on the stability of the boson star, you take the most marginally stable, which is the boson star with R equals 9m. And then we compare this to a black hole. So what do we see? We see, for example, that in the Schwarzschild black hole, this is more or less what we expect. So the boson star, this isotropically emitting sphere is orbiting around a central black hole. We are observing this from an angle of about 80 degrees with respect to the, uh, to the vertical axis. And we see that when this star goes behind the black hole, the star gets distorted. The primary image gets distorted. There is a secondary image appearing. And finally, this image disappears when the star comes again into the front of the, um, of the, of the black hole. Now, what happens if the object is a boson star or a Proca star instead of a black hole? There are many differences. Like there's differences in the shape of the images. There's differences in the angular, um, uh, in the angular deflection. But the most important difference is the appearance of a third image. Notice how in the Schwarzschild black hole, you have a primary image and a secondary image, and that's all. But if you take, for example, the Proca star, let's take the Proca star here. When the star goes behind the Proca star, you get the primary image distorted as predicted. You get a secondary image appearing, but this secondary image divides into two. And the same thing here in the boson star. So instead of two images, we have three images. And the first question we want to ask is, where does this third image come from? To do so, what we do is to take a particular time. So a time at which an instant of time at which the three images are present, and we trace the geodesics of all of these uh, three images and check what happens. So here are the geodesics. So we take an image, a photo of the, um, of the boson star at some instant of time where the three images are present, the primary, the secondary, and this extra one that appears in the center, we choose three pixels here, the red, red, and red pixels, one in each image correspond to the pixels we are going to ray trace, and we use the ray tracing code Giotto also developed by Frederick Vincent in the gravity collaboration to check what are the trajectories of the photons for each of these pixels. So for the first image, this is pretty much straightforward. We know that the, this object that is orbiting the central boson star is orbiting in the equatorial plane. Equatorial plane means Z equals zero. And we know that he is orbiting, it is orbiting at a radius R equals eight M. So, here it is. The object that is emitting this radiation stands at this point here. And the observer is at infinity. The geodesic, what it does is simply to go above the boson star and reach the observer. This is pretty much the same that happens for, for a black hole. For the secondary image, again, pretty much the same that happens for a black hole. We have our object in the equatorial plane. Equatorial plane means z equals zero. And it is at a radius, orbital radius of r equals 8m. Here it is. The observer is at infinity, again, at the angle of around 80 degrees corresponding uh, with respect to the, to the vertical axis. And here we see what happens. The geodesic, the photons, pretty much go below the boson star and reach the observer. Again, this is precisely what happens to the black hole. And now, what is new? What is new is the third image here. So let's take this pixel and trace this geodesic. What do we see? Well, again, the object stands at r equals 8 in the equatorial plane. Here it is. And the observer is at infinity. Here it is. And now, if we trace this geodesic, we see that the geodesic corresponding to this extra image goes all the way to the center. So this uh, horizontal axis, I should have said this when I started showing the images. I said that the vertical one is the the, is the z, but I didn't say what the, what the horizontal one is. The horizontal one is the radius, so the distance to the center. So if you check this third geodesic, you see that the geodesic goes all the way down to zero radius. So the geodesic is crossing through the interior 
of the boson star. And now we understand why we do not see this, uh, this image in the, in, the, in the case of a black hole, because any geodesic that crosses this close to the center gets trapped inside the event horizon. So this image does not appear in black holes, but it does appear in boson stars and Proca stars because, as I said at the beginning, they do not have event horizons. So it is possible that photons crossing through the interior of the boson star reach the observer, and this causes the appearance of this third image, which is pretty much the biggest difference in the observations between these three objects that, I, that I've shown you before. Now, another thing you can do, and, um, and the gravity collaboration is doing, is to integrate the fluxes around the complete orbit. So in here, I'm showing you a picture of a given instant of time, and you see that uh, there are pixels, there are obs observation parts of the, of the screen of the observer that are illuminated and others are not. But this is just for a precise, for a given instant of time. So what you can do is to take a full orbit and integrate all the, the intensities of all the pixels around the complete orbit. So if you do that, what do you see? So in here, you have the integrate. This is called the integrated flux. In here, you have the integrated flux for the Schwarzschild case. And in here, you have the integrated flux for the boson star case with the radius r equals 9m. So what do we see? We see, for example, that the left part of this plot here and in here again for the, for the boson star, we see that the intensity here is bigger than on the, on the right side. This is just caused by the, by the Doppler shift. So if the object is orbiting around the center like this, when the object is moving towards us, the intensity is bigger. And when the object is moving away from us, the intensity is lower. So this part here where the intensity is bigger on the left corresponds simply to the, um, uh, the Doppler shift. And uh, we can see that these images are pretty much the same for the boson star, for the most compact boson star and for the Schwarzschild black hole. The only difference is that there is this extra horizontal line here in the boson star that you do not see in the Schwarzschild black hole. And this is caused by the third image crossing the center of the, the observer screen, as I shown you before. Now, what happens if you change the mass or the radius of this boson star? Well, this, this is what happens. So if you increase the radius of the boson star, so if you decrease the, uh, the compactness of the boson star, this is what happens. So in here, we have boson stars with radius equals 9m, 12m, 15m, and 20m. And as we expect, more or less, as you increase the radius of the boson star, so you decrease the compactness of the boson star, the deflection angles are smaller and smaller, and eventually it reaches to a point where the secondary image doesn't even appear. So if you can compute, if you can observe um, the integrated fluxes from the, the center of our galaxy caused by these infrared flares, and you can compare this with, uh, with our predictions, you can effectively impose constraints on the radius of the boson star, if it is possible at all that uh, the object is a boson star. One more thing that can be observed is the magnitude and the centroid of the observations. So the magnitude is simply, at a given instant of time, the sum of all the fluxes in all the pixels, and the centroid is the geometric center in your image of all the pixels that have some flux. So this is what we observe. Again, this is for the boson star, the most compact one, the boson star with radius equals 9m. We have four different observation angles, 20 degrees, 50, 80, and 90. On the top panel, we have the magnitudes, and on the bottom panel, we have the centroids. So what happens here? Um, you, let's start with the centroids because I think it's, more, it's easier to understand the magnitudes if we look at the centroids first. So what is the centroid? Again, if I am observing this system from a very small angle, let's call it, for example, 20 degrees, I see the object going around for, for a given, for a given uh, orbital radius. So in blue, we have uh, or, orbital radius equals 8m. The orange is 10m. The green is 12m. And the red is 20m. And we see that if the object is orbiting around the center and there is only one image, only the primary image, then the centroid pretty much follows just a circle or an ellipse if, if there is some, some inclination. Now, if the object is far away from the center, for example, at r equals 20m, there is a secondary image appearing. When the secondary image appears, the centroid of this, uh, of this observation is moved closer to the center because there is an image on the other side pulling the centroid towards, um, towards the center of the observation. 
And this causes also a peak in the magnitude. If you have a secondary image, it means that you are getting more photons than you were before the secondary image appeared. And so there is this peak in the magnitude in here. And this is exactly what we see. Every time the secondary image appears, we get a peak in the observation, in the, in the magnitude. When the secondary image appears, this disappears, this peak in the magnitude goes down. And again, in, every time the secondary image appears, the center is pulled closer to the center. And when the secondary image appears, the, um, the, the center is pulled again away from the center. And this is what we see. Now, one question we asked ourselves, and this led us to, to a new discovery, new, I guess, was the fact that unlike it happens to black hole space times, this secondary image appears only for, I mean, for small inclination angles, this secondary image appears only for large orbital radius. So you can see that for these three interior ones, there is no secondary image, there is no shift in the center, and there is no peak in the magnitude. But if you take an orbital radius too big, for example, R equals 20M, you see that there is a secondary image because the centroid is pulled towards the center and there is a peak in the magnitude. So we ask ourselves the question, why does this effect only happen if the magnitude, if the, um, the orbital radius is too big? And so we came to this, uh, to this new effect uh, that we are still exploring right now. So if you take, for example, a Schwarzschild black hole, you can see that if you take the, the, the equatorial plane, so here in Z equals zero, you can see that for any point in the equatorial plane that is further away from the center than the light ring, you can always find the geodesic that takes, that projects that point into the screen of the observer, which is right here. But if you take a boson star, this is not the same anymore. So here, the green geodesics are the ones that, um, that uh, cross the equatorial plane. Uh, the red ones don't. I mean, on the left side, on the right side of the, of the boson star. And so if you have, for example, an object orbiting in this region where my mouse is, it is outside of the, of the light ring. If the boson star had a light ring, which is R equals 3M, this is outside of R equals 3M, but this object would never be projected into the observer screen because there are no geodesics connecting this point to the observer screen. So you have to be at a radius larger than this in order to project that image into the observer screen. And this is precisely why we don't see this effect for radii of 8, 10, and 12m, but we see it for 20m, which is already in this region. So unlike black holes, where the whole screen is projected into the, um, the observer screen, um, only a portion of the equatorial plane is projected into the observer screen for boson stars and Proca stars. And more precisely, for any point in here, for example, there are two geodesics connecting this point to, um, to the observer, observer screen. And these two geodesics correspond to the two images we see as a secondary image. Instead of just one secondary image, we have these two secondary image, and these two secondary images correspond to these two geodesics coming from, from the center. So I'm pretty much finishing. Uh, as I said, this is just a theoretical framework. We still need to compare this with experiments. And uh, this is what's gonna, what, what we're going to do, to do next. So we are preparing one paper, which just a theoretical background, which is basically what I presented here. And there will be a second paper afterwards where we use the data from the gravity instrument to make comparisons with our predictions and to effectively impose constraints on the model. And that's going to be our second paper, which is going to take a while longer. The first one we hope to submit uh, before the end of the year, at most in January. The second one will require a few more months. But as I said, this is still ongoing work. And, um, and I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting possibility to, to study a bosonic star at the Galactic Center. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you, Joao. Uh, I don't know if uh, there is uh, any question in uh, the room uh, or uh, the chat. If not, uh, I myself, uh, I have some questions. Uh, first of all, thanks for the talk because uh, it's uh, really interesting. And uh, I just wanted to, if you can comment a little bit on how did you get those uh, images? I mean, the, the 
numerical or, or the formalism for when you are we're comparing the the, the smart shield and the program motion star. You mean these ones? That one. And uh, if you can comment on uh, on the formalism or at least the numerical methods or, or the yes. tools that you use, because I'm kind of uh, interested also in in this field. Yes. Okay. So about the solutions for for boson star, these solutions they are obtained numerically because the system you obtain when you take the equations of motion for uh, the Einstein proc or the Einstein Klein Gordon theory coupled to the um, the Klein Gordon equation and the proc equation, the system is very complicated. So we solve them numerically. These solutions here uh, for the boson star and for the proc stars they are both obtained numerically. Now um, to produce these uh, these images. We use the, the, um, the ray tracing software Geo to the one that was developed by Frederick Pinson and collaborators at the Observatory of Paris. We use this software. Now, the thing is that for you to use this software, you need to input a metric or, well, a metric in general or metric and Christoffel symbols, not just the metric, the metric and the Christoffel symbols. They must be imposed analytically. So you need to make an expression and to input this expression into the code. So since our solutions were numerical, what we did was to, uh, to make an analytical fit of the numerical solutions. This analytical fit, it, is, um, it has errors always smaller than 1%. And uh, the average error from R equals 0 to R equals 20, 30, 50 M is of the order of 0.1%. So these, these fits are very well described. They describe very well the, the numerical solutions. So, I think we can be confident that they, they work. So we make the, numer the analytical fit. We introduce the, the analytical fits into the Geoto software and we make the ray tracing. Now the Geoto software not only produces, uh, not only does the ray tracing and, uh, and computes the geodesics and et cetera, it can also simulate a lot of, a lot of different things. And one of the things that is, that is already implemented and you can use is to simulate the orbit of a star around some center and the orbit of a star um, around some, some object, some metric, or some star moving in some metric. And this is what we did. We took a star, an isotropically emitting star with a radius r equals 0 0.5 m, uh, where the m is the, um, the mass of the central object. And we used the simulation to, to make this star orbit the central boson star and Proca star. And then what the Giotto, Giotto software does is to compute the geodesics, project the geodesics onto the observer screen, and produce these images. So these videos, they are not really videos. <laughs> what they are is like a, a sequence of all the images produced by the, uh, by the Giotto software for different time instants. And this is how we produce this, um, this, this videos. So just to summarize, solutions are numerical. We make an analytical fit of these numerical solutions. We implement this fit in the Giotto software and we use the simulation of a star orbiting the center, which is already implemented in the, in the software. Okay, thank you, thank you. I see how powerful is, uh, is this tool. <laughs> Maybe uh, you will uh, error of me in a uh, in few time. And I'm uh, looking forward for your, for your paper. <laughs> thank you. I don't know if there is uh, any question else. Thanks, uh, Victor Luis, again. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to introduce the main uh, speaker, who is uh, uh, he is uh, from here, from the university. Uh, he's going to talk us about uh, Boson Star and the uh, Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for your introduction. 
and uh, that I'm going to give you some uh, insights of uh, a, a long journey that is uh, working on uh, superficial aspects in uh, in modified gravity. I will start. Uh, uh, okay, I will present you a recent uh, a recent work that uh, we will publish. Um, me with uh, my advisor Gonzalo Olmo and in collaboration with uh, uh, Nico Sanchez in the University of Aveiro and Tony Ponto in the University of Valencia in the Department of uh, of Astrophysics. So starting uh, as uh, lots of uh, papers on uh, gravitational phenomena lately. Uh, from uh, 2015, uh, a new window of uh, astrophysical observation has been opened, and uh, it's the detection of uh, uh, gravitational waves. So the uh, LIGO Virgo uh, collaboration is uh, providing us with, uh, with uh, crucial information about uh, uh, about uh, the density distribution of uh, of black holes on in general on uh, compact uh, objects. There is uh, some uh, some tension between uh, our own knowledge, uh, theoretical knowledge of uh, stellar evolution and black hole evolution, and uh, the observations. Uh, as we can see, there is uh, the the distribution of uh, Black holes detected by uh, gravitational waves are uh, as larger masses than ones detected uh, inferred from uh, from electromagnetic uh, observations. Also, there are some objects that uh, are starting to populate the gap uh, between uh, heavy neutron stars and and uh, and light uh, black holes. And uh, there is one merger whose progenitors are inside the pair instability supernovae. Um, all of this uh, motivates us to, to think uh, that uh, our, our theoretical models of uh, stellar evolution, mergers of black hole evolutions are not well defined and also uh, raises questions about uh, uh, the nature itself of these kind of objects. That's where appears the exotic uh, compact objects. Uh, among, among these ones, uh, boson stars play a uh, uh, prominent uh, role. And uh, uh, Joao uh, Luis uh, explained uh, just some minutes before, it's really powerful uh, what this kind of uh, of uh, objects can explain or or uh, that yeah okay so what uh, is a uh, boson star boson star is uh, a gravitationally bound uh, configuration of uh, bosonic particles uh, coupled to gravity which uh, constituent boson is uh, an uh, oscillation uh, oscillating uh, complex uh, scalar phase. So, as in uh, for a white dwarf, uh, the electron degeneracy prevents uh, uh, the gravitational collapse. In uh, in a neutron star, it's the Pauli principle that prevents uh, uh, what prevents uh, gravitational collapse. Uh, here is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle what uh, what prevents the, the gravitational collapse. Boson stars ranges. Uh, uh, Wide, uh, uh, it's a wider range of uh, masses that uh, can have from atomic masses to to astrophysical masses, and uh, its mass depends on the mass of the uh, constituent uh, boson. It has an inverse uh, uh, relation, and if you want for us, if you want to have a um, uh, 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 boson star of one solar mass, for example, you have to provide an Ultralight, uh, ultralight uh, boson. These objects are uh, horizonless, and uh, here I plotted uh, how it's the distribution of the masses uh, of a uh, boson star is uh, uh, in front of uh, the density of a scalar 
field at the center, and respect also to uh, the frequency of the constituent uh, bosom. As you can see, uh, there is a range of allowed uh, frequencies, and uh, it has this uh, really, uh, uh, it has this uh, specific uh, shape of uh, spirals that uh, uh, it's really uh, uh, probably of uh, the, this bosom star. Okay, yeah, and uh, here I plotted also the, uh, the, the radial profile of uh, the scalar field, and as you can see, this object has not a definite uh, surface. A lot of works have been done on bosom stars, uh, on uh, stability, evolution, formation, minerals, rotation. So it, uh, this, these works will be also useful for the work that we are going to carry out that is working with this, but in modified way. Okay, so having these uh, exotic uh, compact objects brings the possibility of studying gravity in a, in a strong field uh, rating. And also that uh, they don't have an, a horizon uh, can uh, potentially give us insights on how to extend uh, Einstein gravity. So, uh, by having the possibility of using uh, any kind of, uh, of uh, modified gravity theory, we are using uh, F of R because it gives us a lot of uh, freedom while keeping the equations in an uh, in acceptable range of uh, simplicity. Um, there are two approaches that can be used in, in F of R gravity. One is uh, the metric one, but the nonlinearity so of, uh, of metric F of R Lagrangian induces dynamical scalar degrees of freedom in the gravitational sector. So we will be using uh, the metric uh, affine or Palatini F of R gravity since it doesn't suffer from this kind of uh, pathologies. And also because there exists a correspondence between this kind of theories and uh, GR that makes us able to use tools developed in GR to study a modified variety problem. So that we are going to use uh, the Palatini formulation. So, okay, there exists a, a correspondence between these uh, two theories. Uh, we have uh, the, these uh, two actions, the, the one above, the FFR action, and the, uh, and the uh, well, these two actions so, uh, have shares the same uh, the same space of uh, solutions. So uh, we can uh, translate a problem uh, located in a FFR uh, theory to a problem located in GR. The only things that we need to to uh, to pay attention to do this uh, translation is that the matrix sectors will be transformed in this way here. I named uh, K, uh, K to the matter to the matter Lagrangian of uh, the, the so-called GR or Einstein frame, and P the matter Lagrangian of uh, the uh, FFR frame. And also, there uh, this uh, this uh, correspondence has a correspondence in, and this correspondence in actions has a correspondence in, uh, in the metrics of each one of the frames that are related uh, as a, with a conformal factor. And uh, here, uh, X and Z is just the, the kin uh, kinematic uh, term of the matter Lagrangian. Okay, so more or less that is what we have. And we are using an quadratic or Starobinsky uh, gravity. So mm, we located in the F of our frame. We have a spherically symmetric metric. We have the matter Lagrangian that uh, normally one puts if one uh, if you want to have a bosom star. And then we translate it to the Einstein frame, where we will be able to use all the techniques and all of the software that is developed for GR. 
So what we have, as you can see, is one frame, we have F of R, a gravity coupled to a linear matter Lagrangian, but in the other frame, we have Einstein gravity, GR, coupled to a nonlinear matter Lagrangian. Okay, so uh, we co uh, compute the Einstein Klein Gordon system, that is uh, the system that will uh, that will uh, uh, define, uh, will describe the bottom star. And okay, it's a huge question uh, that I'm only uh, showing you because, as you can see, now there appear some determinants that uh, only depends on uh, on the psi, on the coupling uh, parameter. Psi is a parameter that goes with the quadratic term of the theory. And uh, uh, these determinants are determinant because uh, uh, they can uh, become uh, zero and blow up uh, the uh, system of differential equation. Okay, so the numerical method. Um, finally, this is a kind of magic always because when you are reading uh, a paper, normally they say a couple of sentences about the whole numerical that you do that, and maybe it's where you spend the most of the time. So more or less, we are following the receipt of uh, uh, numerical relativity. We will write the system of uh, differential equations in order to make it uh, well both, then we will scale it uh, to the dimension, uh, dimension, dimensionless variables. So the system doesn't depend anymore on the mass of the constituent boson or not, not either on either on their uh, frequency. So then what we have to do is to establish a boundary condition in the FFR frame, and we translate them to the GR frame and, uh, and impose them. Uh, the only thing that uh, what we are imposing is uh, uh, regularity at the uh, origin and uh, asymptotic uh, flatness. Then we choose uh, a value of the coupling and we use a run Hakuta with a uh, shooting method that is. If you are looking at the boundary conditions, we have two, two numbers that we have to choose, phi and alpha. So we choose a phi, and then we use a shooting method that is looking at alphas to look at the one alpha that uh, accomplishes the boundary conditions. So uh, if you want to reproduce that and you look on in, in internet for a shooting method with a Rumi Buddha, for sure, there are lots of them. So, okay. Then we have some output from the computation. We have some results. And here I, uh, I plotted uh, results for different values of the, of the theory, for different values of the, the coupling, the gravitational coupling. And the uh, first thing that you can see is that uh, for small values of uh, the scalar density, scalar field density, it doesn't differ much from GR. GR is, uh, is the blue core because psi equal, uh, equals zero is, uh, is the same as having GR. So we need a uh, high uh, uh, scalar field density to notice some differences. And also we can see that uh, for example, in GR, we cannot see the end of the course. Uh, this spiral is supposed to continue. But in uh, FOFR, we see that uh, this course ends in a point. Ends in a point where uh, the determinant that I previously mentioned uh, goes to zero, and uh, uh, there is not possible to, to compute more, more solutions. Okay, so. A uh, negative uh, coupling generates uh, a repulsive uh, gravitational component when a scalar field density is high enough, so larger numbers of particles can be sustained than a larger boson star masses are observed, as we can see in, uh, in, the, in the plots. Also, here we see that uh, the spiraling behavior is, uh, is lost you know, uh, from 
psi equals minus zero, uh, zero point zero five. Uh, stats a one to one relation between bottom star masses and frequencies. And uh, what I mentioned before, these dots are, are just uh, showing the last computable uh, configurations since the conformal factor uh, goes to zero and this conformal factor is in the determinant. So uh, there is no possibility of computing more, more solutions. Here, I, I plotted uh, also this conformal uh, factor. As you can see, we are approaching this last point. A uh, conformal factor uh, grows rapidly. And the relation between the metrics uh, of, uh, both, uh, of uh, both frames uh, has this, uh, this uh, shape. And uh, it reminds us a little bit to what happens in uh, scalar fields in uh, FFR and Kalkin FFR gravity uh, when happening when uh, uh, wormholes are found. These are not wormholes, but it's like um, it's like it's really similar. So okay, we cannot say that we are having uh, wormholes or that we cannot compute more uh, solutions because they are having wormholes. But uh, further work has to be done in that direction because it's, it, it really looks similar. On the other side, we have the results in the, for the positive, uh, for the positive uh, parameter of a uh, 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 gravitational coupling parameter. So uh, this, uh, this uh, positive coupling contributes to gravitational attraction when star velocity is high enough. So less mass can be supported. As you see, masses are a little bit lower. Uh, the behavior more or less is the same, but uh, there is a tighter spiral. And uh, again, dots show that uh, the last uh, computer configuration since conformal factor goes to zero. And uh, it's not possible to compute more solution again. Again, what we are uh, here, the the radial profiles shows us again some behavior that makes us think about wormholes. Okay, so we got, we computed also the the radius relations and the and its compactness and boson star doesn't have a, a, a definite uh, surface. So what we are doing is comparing the is so determining it by the the uh, the radius by the this the radius uh, that is containing the ninety percent of of the mass of the bosons. Uh, again, only density is high enough show differences from uh, from uh, gr. The and the same that happens uh, in the plot. Uh, C positive uh, is showing. More or less the same trend as we are, but ne the negative one, the one that has a repulsive uh, uh, gravitational component, uh, shows a different behavior. We added self uh, interaction to the potential, and uh, what we see is that adding uh, self uh, self interactions just uh, makes. Uh, uh, makes differences even harder to, to notice. When higher is the self interaction, it's more difficult to uh, notice differences. So, okay, more or less that's all. Just uh, to give you some uh, final remarks and to sum up. Uh, it is possible to translate the FFR gravity coupled to a linear matter Lagrangian to a GR coupled to a nonlinear matter Lagrangian. Uh, there, there can exist static solutions of boson stars in a Palatini quadratic FFR gravity. Uh, as we can say, uh, as we can, uh, as we uh, saw, a uh, shorter range of uh, scalar field amplitudes. Uh, are allowed for 
איפה פאר בוטום סטארקס. New uh, features arise so when the gravitational coupling is negative, so we have lost this inspired behavior, also the compactness is, uh, is uh, different, we see, go home. we see that the compactness blows also away and goes to, to uh, synthetic infinity. These results are valid for uh, Palatini, Epufar, Boston Stars, but also they are uh, they are uh, the same uh, results for GR couple to an unconventional matter Lagrangian. They are equivalent. So F of R boson stars do not differ significantly from uh, GR boson stars and depend on the magnitude of the, the gravitational coupling and are indistinguishable for a small uh, uh, scalar field density. As if any interactions in the scalar field potential enlarges the degeneracy existing between FFR boson stars and GR boson stars. And the deformation relation between the areas of the FFR and GR frames reminds the behavior of wormholes. Even though uh, further work has to be done to shine a light on these topics. So that's all, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Now it's time for questions. Are First one. The fact that these stars have no horizon from a physical point of view. Since if you have a planet orbiting around the star, about the presence of atmosphere of the star affects the, the orbit of the interaction between the planet and the star. Yes. No, it, it is that it will affect, and this is what uh, Joel Luis uh, uh, said before that the, he ha he needed to put the planet in uh, in a, a radius big enough because uh, if not, it uh, it affects. And which way? I, I I'm not sure, but uh, if you compare them to a black hole, it's uh, it's different. Yeah, Okay. Hmm. okay. Hmm. okay. Which one? Oh, which? <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, the potential that you, you used in the last slide. Okay. You just use lambda positive. Yes. But if you change the sign of lambda, you actually get a uh, Higgs potential, no? Uh, no, this is the Higgs potential. Because, okay, it's because how I define the, the potential. Uh, things uh, are changed. But, uh, okay, this is a Higgs uh, potential. The fact that the square that the high field relaxes on a Okay. So the, 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 the other the other sign will will um, not uh, accomplish uh, the energy. Um, I don't remember the name in English, but uh, the energy um, conditions. So that that's why I use only this uh, this thing. Okay. And, and a question from the chat, yeah, from John. It, it seems like the difference between TR and FFR only arrives in the region where the uh, boson stars are un, uh, unstable. Is that so? Uh, yes, it seems that uh, that's what happens. Uh, but also, okay, that depends on the on the magnitude of the coupling uh, uh, gravitational parameter. So. I used uh, I used uh, some some values for that that are I think are, are too big just because uh, okay this is a, a qualitative uh, a study not a quantitative one uh, and that and you can make it even uh, bigger you can uh, give some uh, bigger uh, size and you will have these differences before. 
in the in the stable in the stable uh, range. Oh, is there any other? Yeah. Uh, if I understand correctly, the the fact that the curves and at some point hmm. is due to the fact that the conformal factor vanishes and your equations become simpler. Yeah. So in principle, you could go beyond that point doing the integration in the original frame without performing any conformal transformation. The thing is that uh, you cannot do the integration on the uh, original frame because, uh, okay, you won't have these, uh, these uh, equations. You will, you will have uh, another one more complicated. You even will have more equations. So it's, uh, it's not uh, just like that. that. That's why I say that we have uh, we computed solutions just to that point, and we don't know what happens after that because there, there might be more solutions, but we we don't know using this this formality because they, we need to do more work in order to know what happens after that density. Well, it's more complicated, but in principle, yes, you, yeah, you do. yeah. Hi, so curiosity, but it it. It's a, it's a curiosity between these two talks uh, uh, this morning. So, uh, Joao proposed to uh, mimic the properties of a supermassive black hole mm -hmm. with a bosonic star. Then, uh, one of the first slides that you have presented, uh, you said that, that the mass, the total mass of the bosonic star depends, inversely depends on the, on the mass of the, of the considered boson. Uh, no. Yeah. So, in order to obtain a, a supermassive black hole, one would have to require an infinitesimal mass for the, the bosom. Yes. Do yes. this uh, request is supported by particle physics. Uh, <laughs> yes. Whatever it wants. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, uh, and why? Why? Uh, for sure. A so massive uh, boson star would not collapse under the effect of value and create a black hole. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about. The physics behind this, uh, these bosom stars. Okay, from a particular uh, uh, particle point of view, also uh, we don't know which is the boson that is constituent uh, of uh, of uh, these objects. And uh, for at least for me, uh, the mass of this boson is just a number, and I'm not. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> if there is a lot of science uh, behind of that. Uh, that. Uh, that I, I I'm not an expert uh, on that, so yeah, maybe, particle maybe physicists that. will 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 it's see. It's a question for for particle physicists. So yeah, course. exactly, completely. No. Totally. Okay. <laughs> okay. So question? No. Uh, so let's stand up there again. Okay? Okay. Okay, I will present the, the next. Oh, okay. uh, is, is, is that is there again? Is there <laughs> Okay, so uh, I have the honor to present uh, the next uh, speaker, who is uh, uh, Adrián Casado Turrión from the Complutense University of, uh, of Madrid, and uh, he's also going to, to talk about uh, some uh, aspects of uh, FOPAR uh, metric uh, gravity. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, for the presentation. And of course, thanks uh, to Gonzalo and to all the organizers for the great workshop, for the hospitality, and for letting me present this talk here today. So, uh, as Andreu said, uh, my name is Adrián Casado Turrión, and I am a PhD student at Complutense in Madrid, uh, working under the supervision of Antonio Lovado and Álvaro de la Cruz Tambi. And today I'm going to talk about a topic which has not received as much, as much attention as it should have, which is gravitational collapse in metric f of r gravity. Okay, so uh, this uh, talk 
is based on a paper that is going to appear on the archive very, very soon, hopefully. So if you're interested in the topic, please stay tuned. And uh, because, well, this, um, uh, this, this work contains a lot of calculations, which are very uh, complicated sometimes. I will just give a, a very conceptual uh, presentation. Um, first, motivating uh, the, the problem, then uh, uh, presenting our results, and finally, uh, detailing some prospects. Okay. So, what is it about? So, in this work, we are considering the simplest possible uh, model for gravitational collapse of a star. Okay. Uh, in this case, we are considering uh, the star. This means that we have a spherical star which, which has a vanishing pressure. Okay. And we are also considering that the uh, energy density of the star is uh, spatially uniform. Okay, it can it can depend at most in time. Okay, the star ends at a certain spherical hypersurface, which is called the stereoid surface, sigma star. Okay, and outside this star we have vacuum. Okay, so we let this system collapse under its own gravitational pull. And uh, we want to know what happens in a certain metric of our theory uh, with this star. Okay? Typically, as in general relativity, the star will end up collapsing into a black hole. Okay? But in F of our gravity, this is not always the case because of the modified dynam dynamics of the theory and also uh, depending on the values of the initial uh, energy density of the star and other parameters of the so typically, in a typical problem of gravitational collapse, what we do is first to uh, find the interior and exterior metrics, okay, using the equations of motion, okay, and then uh, we have to glue both space times, okay, at this stellar surface sigma star, okay, and uh, this means that we are going to uh, consider that the metric has a part which vanishes only on the exterior of the star, and another part that vanishes on the interior of the star. Okay. And however, when we do this, we must be very, very careful, because uh, when we do this decomposition with this theta function, the metric becomes a distribution value, and then uh, we can have problems with the equations of motion. For example, uh, the equations of motion will, will, will have terms which go like products of derivatives of the metric, and because of these theta functions, then uh, we will have products of derivatives of theta functions, and of course this is a product of deltas. Okay? And as we all know, the product of uh, distributions is not well defined in general, uh, and thus we might, must make sure that these terms uh, have prefactors that vanish identically. Okay? And these sets uh, the so-called junction conditions, okay, uh, which must be imposed so as to guarantee that the equations of motion of motion are properly defined in the distributional sense. Okay. Typically, in, in practice, okay, these junction conditions uh, typically fix the evolution of the stellar surface, okay, and also uh, fix the relationships between the parameters of the interior and the exterior solutions. Okay. So, for example, just to see how this works in the simplest case, which is general relativity. Okay, uh, first we need to solve the equations of general relativity, the Einstein equations. And uh, for the interior metric, okay, we get a uh, Friedman uh, Robertson Walker space time, okay, with a scale factor which uh, decreases uh, from an initial value to, to zero following a cycloid curve. Okay, this is the cycloid equation. And uh, for the exterior, in general relativity, there is only one possibility, which is the Schwarz metric, okay, given in visual coordinates. So uh, in the interior spacetime, okay, we are using commoving coordinates. Uh, this means that uh, we are uh, following the trajectories of the particles of the fluid, okay, and choosing time as the proper time, okay. And because the coordinates are moving, okay, the stellar surface in this uh, interior coordinates will be simply given by a certain constant value of the uh, moving radius that we call T star, okay? Uh, however, in Schwarzschild coordinates, okay, the usual ones, 
Uh, the star surface is given by two functions, t star of tau and r star of tau. Okay, and why and why 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 is uh, does this happen? Well, because of course the the, the stellar surface is uh, spherically symmetric, so uh, it cannot depend on the angular variable. Okay, and it cannot depend on on heat because heat is constant at the stellar surface. So we have that uh, these two relations must must. Be. So once we have uh, solved the Einstein equations. We then impose the junction conditions of general relativity, which are these two um, expressions. First, we must require that the induced metric at the stellar surface uh, is continuous at uh, the stellar surface, okay? and that the extrinsic curvature of this uh, stellar surface uh, is also continuous. Okay? These quantities are fine here, but this is an important thing. Okay? So when we compute these quantities for the space time that uh, I showed before, uh, we get the following set of equations, okay, for general relativity. Uh, first, we get uh, from the first junction condition, uh, which is the continuity of the induced metric, we get this first equation, which relates the radius of the star with the scale factor, and we see that the radius of the star is proportional to the scale factor, and thus, in general relativity, it decays following a cycloid because that's the behavior of the uh, scale function. Okay, once we have r, we can substitute r of tau here in this right hand side of the second equation. And this is a function of tau. Okay, so we can integrate this equation and determine univocally function t star. So, with the first junction condition, what we have done is to determine the evolution of the stellar surface as I uh, anticipated. Uh, the second junction condition is much simpler. Uh, it's just one equation, this equation here, relating this function of tau here, which appears here too, uh, with a constant, okay? And combining this junction condition with the other ones, we finally get a relationship between m, which is the parameter of the exterior spacetime, and rho zero, which is the initial density of the star, which is the parameter of the interior space, and also the commuting, the commuting radius of the Okay, so this was, uh, the case in general relativity, this well is a classic result of general relativity. It's been known since 1939. Okay, and it's uh, the very very famous Oppenheimer Schneider model of gravitational collapse. Uh, it predicts that the star collapses to a black hole at finite uh, tau time or infinite t time. Okay, and even though it's uh, purely academic uh, and very very simple, uh, it's a quite instructive result. Because, of course, it is an exact match solution of general relativity. And it is also a very illuminating example because it explains the main features of gravitational collapse without being too complex. And this relies on the fact that the pressure of the star is zero. And this means that there are no other interactions aside from, from gravity taking place here. Okay. So it is natural to ask well, is this a proper match solution of any other metric of our theories of gravity? For example, we can just consider the, the simplest uh, possibility, which is simply general relativity plus a cosmological constant. Okay, and in this case, there are only very very minor changes with respect to ER. The interior metric is still a Friedman space time. Okay, but we have some modified dynamics for this scale factor. Okay, and the exterior space time is partial plus a term uh, with the cosmological constant. It has partial the sitter or anti the sitter space time. And in this simple theory, junction conditions are the same as in GR, and we get exactly the same equations, including the one for m and rho zero. So, as we can see, in this case, there are very, very few changes. Okay, here uh, we can have, uh, because of the modified dynamics, we can have situations in which, depending on the value of lambda and of m, the star does not collapse; it bounces. Uh, but uh, mathematically, the operations, the way of proceeding, is the same as in. If we consider truly non-trivial FOFR theories, okay, those which have um, a function f whose second derivative with respect to r is different from zero, okay, then things start to get fun, okay, because well, the, the spacetime inside the star is still Friedman, okay, but now the dynamics of the scale factor are, are quite more complicated because we have now terms which go like f and its derivatives, okay. 
And in this case, junction conditions are different from those of general relativity. Okay, apart from the typical ones here, the continuity of the metric and of the extrinsic curvature, now we have to impose two additional junction conditions, namely the continuity of the rich scalar at the stellar surface at the continuity of the normal derivative of the rich scalar at the uh, stellar surface, okay? And these two new junction conditions are related to the fact that in metric of our gravity, the rich scalar is effectively a scalar degree of freedom which is independent from the metric, okay? So, uh, let's see, well, we are now in a position to, to solve the question, is Oppenheimer's Snyder collapse uh, a solution of a uh, metric of our gravity. So uh, if we impose that the exterior is Svartsev, okay, then the continuity of the rich scalar at the stellar surface would require that uh, the interior rich scalar vanishes, okay? Oops, sorry. Because the, the, the exterior rich scalar is zero, okay? So one could uh, argue that, well, we have here a function of tau on the left hand side, but the right hand side is not a function of tau. In fact, it vanishes. So, does this mean that the matching is impossible in f of our gravity? Because, of course, if we have a static space time, it cannot match a non static space time, right? Well, uh, that's not the case. And why? Because we have to interpret this as a further constraint on the scale factor. Okay, and indeed this is a first order, a second, sorry, order differential equation for, for A, and we can integrate that equation with the usual junction conditions, and we get, in fact, a very simple expression for the scale factor, you know, and for K uh, greater than zero, this square root uh, scale factor actually resembles a lot the cycloidal scale factor of general relativity. Why? Because if k is positive, then of course this describes a collapsing space time, uh, which in fact collapses at finite proper time, okay, just like Oppenheimer's collapse. Okay, it also describes a dynamic space time because this clearly depends on tau, okay, even though the rich scalar is zero, okay, and finally, uh, by construction, this scale factor complies with all deduction conditions because, of course, if the rich scalar is zero, then it's the its derivative is also zero, and then the fourth junction condition um, is also that satisfied, okay? So, is this everything? Have we solved the problem? So, as you may have guessed, of course, this is too good to be true, and there's a problem because we have obtained this scale factor using the junction conditions and not the equations of motion, okay? And if we require in the equations of motion of f of our gravity for any f of our gravity, that the uh, rich scalar of this uh, Friedman must be uh, constant, then the equations of motion tell us that the uh, scale factor must be constant and not given by this square root. Because the scale factor is constant by the first junction condition, then the stellar radius is constant, and therefore there is no collapse. So we have learned a few things with this. First, we have learned that, of course, Oppenheimer's Snyder collapse is not a solution of nonlinear of gravity. And the problem resides in the fact that the exterior cannot be spotted, which remember that in uh, general relativity is something which is required by Birkhoff's theorem. So basically, in f of our gravity, uh, we must be open to the possibility that the exterior could be any spherically symmetric solution of the theory. Okay, and we have learned another very important lesson, which is that when we try to extract information with, uh, from the junction conditions, then we must always check that what we get is compatible with the equations of motion. In this sense, the the, the junction conditions are kinematical in the sense that they they only tell us about relationships between metrics, but uh, then they are disconnected from the, uh, the uh, equations of motion. So we must make sure that they are compatible. So uh, now we start to see that the problem is getting complicated, okay? So we need a systematic way of approaching gravitational collapse in metric of a program, okay? So how do we do that? Well, uh, well uh, of course, because we do not know a priori 
what the space time outside the collapsing star is, uh, there are two ways of tackling this, this problem of collapse. No? First, we can try to uh, develop the junction conditions between the most general spherically symmetric solution and the interior space time, and uh, then try to exclude possibilities, uh, try to learn as much as possible from the exterior space time using the junction conditions. And then, once we have done that, we can go to our favorite catalog of FFR uh, solutions, uh, take one of them and uh, plug it into the equations of motion, and then see whether uh, that space time actually matches or not the uh, equations of the, the interior space time. Sorry. So these two uh, ways of proceeding are severely hampered by a number of computational shortcomings, as we shall see right now. But uh, here in this work, what we have done is just uh, this first, try to infer properties of the uh, exterior metric, and then, well, try to... Okay. So, as I said, we must then consider the most general spherically symmetric solution of FFR gravity. Here, yeah, we are even considering a metric which is time-dependent, something which is impossible in general relativity. Okay. This metric can always be expressed in this form, choosing this, this area radius coordinates. Okay. And then we intend to match this with the interior space time at the stellar surface, which is given by the relations I, I, I showed before. So, uh, after working out all the junction conditions, we get the following. First, we get uh, from the first junction condition, we get something very similar to the uh, Oppenheimer Snyder case. Okay? Using these coordinates, which is something very important, uh, we see that the stellar radius, again, is proportional to the scale function. Okay? And from here, we can substitute uh, this R star here, and we integrate this equation to get T star. So basically, the first junction condition works exactly the same as before. It simply determines the evolution of this stellar surface. Okay. Now, the second junction condition is a bit more complicated than before, because we now have two equations which are not satis satisfied at the same time uh, in principle. Okay. So something a bit more complicated now. And what about the novel junction conditions when we get two extra uh, constraints on the exterior geometry, okay? And of course, uh, we must uh, take into account that in principle, both the second and also the third and the fourth junction conditions, in principle, uh, must be used to establish relationships between the parameters of the interior solution, essentially the energy, the initial energy density of the star, with the parameters of the exterior. Okay. So once we have this set of junction conditions, we can start manipulating them and uh, try to rule out or discard as many uh, classes of exterior space time as possible. And this is exactly what, what we do. And we have uh, found a series of, of results, which are very, very interesting, uh, because we have been able to constrain the exterior metric quite a, uh, quite a bit. For example, we have found that if your exterior space time has a constant Ricci scalar, then it cannot match the interior uh, Friedman in any f of r theory of gravity. Okay. We have also found that no static exterior matches the stellar interior. Okay. Uh, which is something unthinkable in, in, in general relativity. Okay. Uh, one can think, well, can I just take Schwarzschild and make the mass time dependent uh, or something like that, some kind of ansatz? Well, the answer is no, you can't, because any exterior space time of this form, when you have a function A on the TT component and one over A in the R, R component, is also ruled out by the junction conditions even if this metric is uh, non-static. Non okay, so this is also a very, very powerful result. And for example, if you think, well, but I can have a static space-time, then add uh, a time and R-dependent redshift factor to the T component, and well, that doesn't match either. And of course, there are other forms of, of the exterior metric which are ruled out by the tension condition. So we see that uh, we have 
obtained that the exterior metric must be time dependent and it must be time dependent in a very, very non trivial way. Because basically, every simple answer one can imagine for the exterior metric is basically ruled out by the junction conditions. And of course, one cannot exclude the possibility uh, that no space time matches the interior at all. But of course, at this point, we cannot say uh, whether this is true or false. Okay? So, uh, well, basically, uh, every, every uh, vacuum, exterior vacuum solution of uh, F or phi gravity could be the exterior solution. Uh, and then we can try to see, well, okay, we, we have these constraints, we know which space times, uh, well, at first sight, we can say this space time is of the form required by the junction condition. Okay, so does it match? Okay, the problem is that there are very, very few vacuum solutions, uh, time dependent vacuum solutions of for gravity which are known. Okay, even for very, very simple theories like Stravinsky F of R gravity. Okay, and uh, non solutions yield very complicated junction conditions which are very difficult to manipulate analytically. Okay, it is not like in open Heimerschneider collapse, which is something you can do in half an hour. So, uh, if one thinks of uh, attempting to solve the problem numerically, then another problem arises, which I call the problem of parameter determination, okay? Uh, because, uh, as you have seen, uh, an integral part of uh, solving a problem of collapse consists in determining relationships between the parameters of the interior solution and the exterior one. For example, when we obtain a relationship between M and rho zero, okay? And uh, it seems uh, difficult to uh, obtain, obtain this uh, numerically, okay? This kind of relationships numerically, okay? So this is also a potential problem if you want to treat this problem uh, numerically. And this points out uh, to the necessity of developing some sophisticated techniques in order to fit this. So just uh, to sum up, uh, why is studying gravitational collapse important in epochar gravity or any other theory of gravity? So uh, gravitational collapse, of course, is a central part of every gravitational theory. Structure formation is done via gravitational collapse, and therefore we must study it. It is important per se, okay? And uh, in F metric of our gravity, as we have seen, it's still poorly understood. Uh, however, our, our, our best attempt uh, to study this problem is by studying the simplest model, which is uh, the collapse of a dust star. Uh, in this case, the difficulties are, well, all come from the exterior metric, okay? Because we have very few known vacuum solutions of F of our gravity, which are not ruled out by the junction conditions. And those who exist and are known to satisfy the junction, well, to be at least compatible with the junction conditions, uh, give very, very complicated calculations. So, as you can see, there's plenty of work to be done in this area. For example, one could try to find exteriors motivated by these junction conditions. Okay, so if you want to have a space time named after yourself, uh, this is a good opportunity. Okay. And then this new space times would be used as um, uh, possible exteriors, you know. And also, this is important because, uh, well, gravitational collapse in FFR gravity has a surprising um, relationship to more fundamental physics, in particular to the black hole no pair theorems. Okay, because as, as, as we all know, uh, FFR gravities uh, can be cast. Uh, as a theory which propagates an extra scalar degree of freedom, okay? And most of our theories of gravity satisfy, have a, a field which satisfies the, the no pair theorems, which uh, state that the only black hole that can result from gravitational collapse, in this case of the cluster, is Schwarz. okay? So this uh, is something which is very positive. Uh, first, because we are connecting with more fundamental physics, Second, because this could be a guide for this kind of discarding exteriors, okay? Because if we work in a theory which satisfies these no pair theorems, then we know that the exterior space time at some point must reduce dynamically to okay? Because the only 
blood pool that, that can form pair is structured. Okay. So this is a potential guide to discard exteriors to make our lives easier. And finally, uh, of course, the exterior metric must be non-trivial uh, because you have this scalar here, you have this non-trivial scalar field outside the star, which is excited by the presence of Matza. Okay. And uh, well, as pointed out by Pablo Bueno and Pablo Cano, uh, of course, if the uh, resulting black hole is Schwarzschild, then, which has a vanishing or a constant scalar field, then this scalar hair must go away uh, somehow, must be radiated away. So this could, uh, this could be explained by a model of gravitational collapse, also in the for gravity when we translate to the Einstein frame of the, the field. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And have you thought about implementing this analysis with a small amount of the metric for describing the last the last with you mean the, the interior metric? Yeah. yeah, the thing is that uh, no we haven't. The, the answer is we haven't, because if you put uh, this uh, matter source that is a spherically symmetric and uniform density uh, does start, then the solution of the interior field equations is free, not a uh, formal metric. There's no way of sending the result to something like this. It, it could be, but then you would be modifying the matter source. I mean, it would be something a bit more complicated oh. than a uniform density uh, um, dust star. And the thing is that, of course, you, you have seen that even in this simplest case, everything well. Is, is complicated. So introducing more complexity uh, could, could only make the problem was in principle, in principle, but who knows, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay. uh, so if there are no uh, more questions, let's, uh, let's just uh, thank uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, next. Ah, Eh, no tengo un pelo. Eh, no tengo un pelo. No Okay, so 
Our next uh, speaker is uh, Pavel Dran uh, Palau, who is also a member of uh, our group in, here in Valencia. And uh, okay, yes, uh, we're going to listen to you. Gabriel, for the introduction. So, well, uh, from the, well, I'm going to talk about the, the derivative invariance and the actual anomaly, okay, in the context of particle deviation. I, I know that the, these, these people can, can um, uh, seem a bit uh, complex and unrelated to gravitation, but you will see that it's uh, quite related. And, um, okay, to, to some, I, um, I would like in this, in this talk to, to give you a, a different idea of the well known uh, action anomaly. Okay, for if, if there's, if there's uh, someone who does, uh, doesn't know what is it, the action anomaly is a, a characteristic of the of the uh, massless direct uh, fields, uh, which which has a classical symmetry, which is the actual symmetry. But uh, when they are considered as as, as quantum uh, fields, the, this symmetry is broken, and there is a, a creation of axial charge. Okay, and this, this is known as the axial. Anomaly. And uh, I'm, I'm going to show you how this is related with the, the, the well-known um, phenomenon of uh, particle creation, and uh, more specifically with the adiabatic, adiabatic invariance of this process. Okay. Uh, I, first of all, we will see it in detail. First of all, I'm going to introduce this phenomenon of uh, particle creation. Okay, it was first, first introduced by Leonard Parker in 1966. Uh, in the context of uh, quantum field theory in curved space terms, which is a theory. <clears throat> which is a uh, semi-classical theory that considers the, the uh, um, a quantum field coupled to the gravity, which is considered uh, classic. Okay? So um, in this in this context, he uh, uh, realized that the, there is a phenomenon which is the creation of particles uh, spontaneously from the vacuum. Okay? And uh, uh, well, he, he first uh, introduced it in the context of uh, for the case of a real scalar field in a in a expanding universe. Okay. And uh, uh, in quantum field theory, in current space science, uh, this, this uh, case is, is described by this uh, equation, the claim of an equation with the metric of the space state. Okay? And uh, well, uh, the, the equation of the field is described in this equation here that uh, we can see is uh, like a harmonic oscillator uh, equation with a variable uh, time varying frequency, okay, which will be useful later to understand the. The adiabatic invariance process. Okay, we can see here that the the, the, the time varying frequency uh, depends on the on the derivatives of the metric. And well, uh, to to understand this this phenomenon, it, it is useful to consider a bounded expansion, which means that imagine a universe that uh, initially is Minkowski, uh, 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 it uh, starts increasing no, uh, to expanding, and uh, finally it uh, ends. Uh, uh, again, in, in Minkowski, okay, with a different scale factor. So, why we, uh, we consider this case? Because in this case, we can define uh, it's, it is well defined the uh, particle number, okay, the, the number of, of particles of the of the field initially and finally, okay. So, if we put, we will consider that the that the vacuum is uh, initially in, in uh, every times, uh, it is is the same to consider that the field is uh, mathematically the same to consider the field uh, in this way, okay? A, a positive frequency solution, which is a, a, a negative expansion. And uh, the, the expansion of the universe induces that at late times we have a linear combination of positive frequency solutions and negative frequency solutions, okay? And this uh, appearing in negative frequency solutions uh, is the, the, the term that gives the, the particle creation, okay? Why is it not that? Because if we uh, calculate the the vacuum expectation number of, of, of particles uh, of, the, of the, the particles um, uh, it tends to be proportional to this beta factor, which is known as the beta coefficient of Bogolov, and therefore, if it's not zero, we have uh, that, that uh, initially we have zero particles, and finally we have a different, uh, a non-zero number of particles. Okay? And that that is why we conclude that there is a, a creation of particles in the process from the vacuum. Okay, so. Uh, this this concept of adiabatic invariance of this particle number uh, can be explained in, in, in this way. We have seen that the that the, um, the equation of the field was a, a harmonic oscillator uh, equation with a variable frequency. Okay, the energy of the oscillator would be the expression here. Okay, and uh, this kind of, of harmonic oscillator uh, is it is well known that they, they have a property which is that the, this cosine here between the energy and the, and the frequency 
it is an it's a mathematic invariance, which means that the, in the limits in the, uh, of an uh, infinitely slow variation of the frequency, this quantity is conserved. Okay. Uh, in our case of a boundary expansion, okay, the, the energy will be the, the initial frequency, and the final energy will be this expression here. Okay, and, and comparing this this quantity initial and late times, so we can see that if, if this quantity must uh, has to be uh, conserved in the adiabatic limit. We have that uh, the beta coefficient must be zero in the adiabatic limit. Okay, so we can conclude in this in this simple way that the uh, in the, 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 the particle creation uh, for by by gravity um, by the gravity background uh, is is zero. I mean there, there is no particle creation. If we're in the limit of a of a, a slowly infinitely slow uh, expansion of the expansion of the universe. Okay. But uh, we know that this uh, uh, process of particle creation is not, uh, uh, it, it doesn't happen only for uh, gravitational fields. It also happens in, uh, for other fields, like for example, for the electric field. Okay? Uh, and a strong electric field can create from the, uh, from the vacuum spontaneously phase uh, uh, particles and particles. Okay? And it is well known as the Spinger effect. Okay, and it's uh, closely related to this uh, Parker uh, of particle, but in the context of an electric background. Okay, so the question is: in this context of the electric field, uh, this adiabatic invariance of the, of the process of the particle number creation uh, is, is it uh, the same? Uh, they are um, adiabatic invariant, or, or they are polar? They are. <laughs> in some cases, in some cases. Uh, this adiabatic invariance is broken. We will learn in two seats. So, um, uh, as, as in the previous and in the gravitational case, we, we saw that we consider a, a bounded expansion. In this case, we will consider this a bounded um, uh, electric potential, okay? which is the same to consider a pulse, an electric pulse. Okay? Uh, uh, particularly, we, we consider the southern pole, which is that expression there. Okay? And therefore, we, we have this. Uh, Representation here, okay? and you can see that this um, the, the raw uh, the raw parameter is a slowness parameter. Okay, therefore, if we uh, uh, want to study the, the adiabatic limit, the adiabatic of the, the limit of uh, infinitely slow variation of the of this um, electric potential, we have to do the limit uh, raw to zero. Okay, this, this is the way how we will analyze the adiabatic limit. So, well, uh, there are some formulas I, I only show to you, but uh, the, I will just explain the results. Uh, okay, so in the case we have analyzed the, the, the scalar and the direct uh, fields. In the case of a scalar field coupled to uh, an electric background, ah, and we have, uh, we, we start now uh, in the two dimensional case, and then we will uh, generalize to the four dimensional because the, the calculation is easier, it's easier in, the, in this way. So, uh, in two dimensional case, a scalar uh, field in an electric background is that uh, expression there, the, 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 beta, the beta coefficient, which means the, the, the beta, you have to understand it as the, the, the spectrum of momenta of the created particles, okay? And uh, the direct, for the direct field is this expression here, okay? And uh, you trust me when I say you that uh, in the elevatic limit, rotating into zero, uh, these, these two expressions uh, are. 10, 10 to 0 in the case, in the massive case, where the mass is different to 0, and uh, it tends to a non zero value in the, uh, in the case uh, of in the massive case. Okay? What does this mean? This means that in the case of massive particles, we have this adiabatic invariance, okay? the, 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 the beta tends to 0 in the, in the adiabatic limit, but for massless particles, uh, uh, this adiabatic invariance is broken. Okay? So if we have a, an electric pulse uh, that, that, um, that is infinitely slow, and uh, no massive particles are created, but there are massless particles created. Okay. So well, in these uh, both, uh, graphics, you can see this idea more more clearly. Uh, uh, in both cases, you can see that when we well we we are representing here the, the number of particles uh, in terms of the raw power. Okay. So we can see how if we make the raw parameter 10 to 0, in, in all cases, the, the number of particles 10, 10, 10 to 0, except in the matrix case, which is this purple line here, okay? And this purple line here. 
In both cases, we see how if this is the only case in which it tends to a non zero value. Okay. And how is this related with the extra anomaly? Okay. So uh, we are in the two dimensional case. Okay. In two dimensional case, uh, the, the chirality or, or the axial um, chirality is the same. Uh, can be understood uh, very easy because because it's just the um, uh, uh, related with the direction of the movement. Okay, we have two directions of movement in two dimensions, but I, I think two dimensions in the sense that one temporal and one uh, spatial. Okay, so spatially you have two uh, directions of movement, and, and therefore the chirality is related to the direction of movement and the charge in such a way that, uh, for example, you will have a positive charge uh, particle moving. The right, it, it would, would have a right chirality, and if you have a, a negative particle moving to the left, you also have right chirality because it's related to both kind uh, of okay? Therefore, we know that the electric uh, field creates particles in pairs, particle and the particle. And therefore, uh, if a pair is created from the vacuum, in for conservation of movement, it, it must be created in, in opposite momentum, and therefore we have a uh, creation of, of a chirality of a chiral charge. Okay, because we, we start with zero uh, charge and finally we have two particles with right uh, chirality. And therefore, uh, uh, there is a creation of these charge. Okay, okay so uh, this, this chiral charge that is created can be calculated in the case of uh, mass experiment, which is the case we are interested in, but it's the one that makes the uh, invariance. And uh, it is uh, given by this expression that, that we have obtained by, uh, by a method uh, called schematic normalization, which is very uh, useful in this context of quantum field theory in current space times. And we can see that this, this uh, quantity here coincides exactly with the one predicted by the natural anomaly. Okay? As I mentioned before, the actual anomaly is uh, this, this breaking of the classical cell symmetry. And therefore, this quantity here that classically would be zero. Now, when we, when we consider it uh, in the field uh, as a quantum field, uh, it is not zero and it is given by this uh, well known expression. Okay. And therefore, the, the, the creation of chiral charge predicted by the uh, actual anomaly is the same than the one predicted uh, by, by obtaining this, this chiral charge created by the particle equation. Okay. So we can see that uh, both phenomena are related. And in fact, the actual anomaly, you can see that it does not de depend on the elevaticity of the process. And therefore, even in a in a in a adiabatic limit, it, it will remain. Okay. Uh, just like the creation of particles for matter spectrums. Okay, therefore, we just have seen here the relation of both phenomena. And now we are going to uh, generalize these results to the four-dimensional case. Okay. I will not give the detail of the calculation, just the idea that, that the, the expressions of the beta coefficient are the same, just by changing the, the mass by an effective mass, okay, that depends on the case. We will we'll see it now. So uh, you have to you have to have the, the idea that uh, even just uh, like in two dimensions when the mass was zero, there was this breaking of the dramatic invariance. Now it will happen when the effective mass is zero, okay? And then let's analyze the different cases. Case one, we only have electric field because from where in four dimensions we can add a magnetic field, but uh, for now we will just consider electric field. Uh, in this case, this, this effective mass, I mean, the beta expression is the same, but changing the mass by this expression here, which is uh, A1 and A2 are the, the, the perpendicular directions to the electric field that is, has, has been considered in the, in the, uh, in the set uh, direction. Okay? And therefore, we can, we can see that this effective mass is uh, uh, zero only when uh, this this uh, well, the, when the mass is zero and when k one and k two are zero. Okay, but this case uh, is rooted in the integration because it's uh, just a point of the infinite of the infinite uh, spectral momentum, and therefore when we integrate this, uh, this point is not relevant, and therefore we obtain that the the number of particles is zero in the dramatic limit. Okay. In this case, there is no operating for a dramatic invariance. Now let's see the case of an electric field plus a constant magnetic field uh, in such a way that they are not perpendicular. Okay, we have considered they uh, parallel because in a perpendicular uh, case, it's the same as the result is the same as here. Okay, so when they are parallel, well, the um, 
uh, perpendicular uh, momentum, K1 and K2 are, are quantized in this case by the well-known Landau levels when adding, when adding this uh, magnetic field. And therefore, uh, the effective mass now is that, that expression there in the scalar case. And you can see that this expression of the effective mass is, is completely different from zero for any m. Okay, and therefore, in this case, we don't have a uh, breaking of a value of So, okay, the, the particular number tends to zero in the real field. But uh, for massless direct fields, we have that the effective mass is this expression here, and note that this uh, expression vanishes for n equal to zero, okay, for the lower um, uh, position of the, well, for the lower lambda level. And therefore, we have that now this uh, particle number uh, is different from zero in the dramatic limit because now it's not an integration but sum. And in this case, we have uh, that the n equal to zero term gives a non zero value, the rest are zero. And therefore, only in this massless direct field coupled to electric and magnetic field, uh, there is a regional quadratic invariance. And this is so nice because it's exactly the conditions where we have the extra anomaly. Okay, the extra anomaly in four dimensions only appears not for a scalar field, but only for direct fields, direct matrix fields, and uh, when you, you have electric and magnetic non perpendicular uh, variables. Okay, so we have seen that they, these both uh, phenomena, breaking of the invariance and actual anomaly, are given in the same conditions. And uh, we also can, in this case, in this four dimensional case, we can analyze the creation of charts. As before, okay, and the result, the result we have seen also that is compatible with the uh, one predicted by the actual number, right? uh, as in the two dimensional case. And uh, finally, uh, the, the only more contributing uh, to, the, to, the, to the creation of chiral charts is, is n equal to zero, just like happens in the actual normal okay? So, to conclude, we have seen that the, uh, well, at uh, this. Uh, okay, this is just a table to, to, to summarize the, the results. Okay. It's just to see that the cases in which we have the breaking of the invariance, which are uh, electric fields in two dimensions, or electric and magnetic fields in four dimensions, or other direct fields, are the same cases in which the external anomaly appears okay, to show this relation between both. You know. Okay, and to conclude, uh, we have seen that the, the adiabatic invariance. Of the of the particle number, which is which is you know, the particle creation, which is verified uh, when the background is is the gravity, the, the understanding universe, uh, is broken when we are uh, considering an electric background in some special cases, which are uh, matrix particles in two dimensions, uh, matrix fermions in four dimensions, uh, in presence of electromagnetic uh, backgrounds, such that electric and magnetic fields are uh, perpendicular. And finally, we have seen that the breaking of adiabatic invariance uh, is closely related with this uh, process of with this phenomenon of the axial anomaly. Okay, they, they appear in the same conditions. And uh, in fact, this, this creation of, of, of the of chiral charts in the massless and adiabatic limit uh, uh, is compatible with the one predicted by the axial anomaly. And that will be all. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, uh, Al, for your talk. Uh, if uh, there is uh, any break. Ah, uh, in the meantime, I have a little question. Okay. Um, if you can go back to one of the first slides where you, where you show uh, no, 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 forward. Uh, forward. Forward. Uh, the next one, I think. Yes, yes, yes. yes. We see it now here when we deal with a purely adiabatic transformation or with the rho equal to zero. All, all cases go to zero, the number of particle creation, uh, but the massless case, the massless case doesn't. No? Mm -hmm. So that value of part of particle 
was created in the linear flow to zero, mm -hmm. which for the scalars in the field is something between one and two, and mm -hmm. what the field is uh, one point five. Mm -hmm. What depends on? Uh, okay, this well, first of all, uh, you can see that the, for the higher fields, this is constant. Uh, this is different from the star field. This is because of the Pauli principle. Because you, in the Pauli, Pauli principle uh, tells us that you cannot have more than one particle in one state. And uh, since uh, this, this gives you the number of particles integrated in all the, the, the moment. Okay, so therefore, uh, I mean, you, you always have the, the, the same. Well, it's, it's, more, it's complicated to explain, but it's related with the, with the Pauli principle. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, that's uh, it's just the, um, the 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 number that this, that gives the, this uh, when you integrate this because you have um, well I don't know if I can this a bit of and you represent this this beta factor okay you have for mathless for any to zero. To have this like like a, a spectrum in, in, like this for direct fields, okay. And when you integrate them, you have like a little one. And um, this is I think zero and two a zero. So the integration of this gives just a this. And in fact, is this I think is here? Yes, it's something like this two a uh, over p. It's just the number it gives. It's it's the one expected by the actual anomaly. There is uh, a question in the chat. Uh, is there any difference in the creation of particles between fermions and scalars in uh, in two dimensions? Uh, okay, it's um, well, the, the, the difference is that they are different fields, and therefore we are creating bosons of fermions. But uh, it's true that in two dimensions there is a um, a property that uh, that is that there is um, an equivalence between uh, bosons in two dimensions and and fermions in two dimensions. So in fact, uh, the, the actual anomaly that uh, usually it's 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 on the well, it only appears for for fermions in four dimensions. When we are in two dimensions, it also appears based on analog uh, actual anomaly uh, for a scalar fields because there is a, an equivalence. Uh, there is a, a there is, I think, there is a, a transformation that, that can change you a, field, a star field or a fermion field. They are like equivalent in two dimensions. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's. I think we're having a, a short break and we'll come back in, uh, in 15 minutes or so.
Can you hear me? Too. Hi, Gonzalo. Hello, 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 Renan. Hello, how's everything? So, I, know I take care of this. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think it's time to resume the, the session. And our next speaker is Andreas, <laughs> who is going to be a PhD student at the Federal University of Pará in, in Belém, in Brazil. And his supervisor is Luis Crispino. So, uh, Renan, please uh, go ahead whenever you are ready. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to be here today. Um, good morning. Today I'll talk about scattering by deformed black holes. This work was made in collaboration with Luis Leite and Luis Crispino and was recently published on uh, Physical Review D, but you can also find it on archive. Uh, here is the outline of the presentation. First, I will uh, give you a brief review about scattering theory and scattering by black holes. Then I'll talk about the format black holes and the main equations to study scattering uh, by geodesic, glory, and partial wave approaches. Then show some results and conclude with um, our final remarks. Uh, so, since the beginning of quantum mechanics, the scattering theory has played an important role in the development of the theory. Here we have some of the most important scattering experiments made in the first half of the 20th century. For instance, we have the flux experiments on elastic collisions of alpha particles, quantum scattering photons, uh, Fermi experiments on neutron collisions, and so on. But what is to study scattering theoretically? Uh, basically, we want to study how a wave um, changes when it interacts with a uh, scattering potential. Basically, we solve a wave equation coupled to a scattering potential with suitable boundary conditions. For instance, we consider Schrodinger, Dirac, Klein Gordon equation with some potential. Uh, for example, for the Rutherford experiment, this potential is the Coulomb potential. Uh, among the concepts of scattering theory, we have the differential scattering cross section that can put together experimental data and theoretical issues and can be defined as the ratio of the energy flux per unit of solid angle of the outgoing wave to the energy flux per unit area of the incident plane wave, or can uh, be written in terms of the scattering amplitude uh, as given by this expression that we will use later. But to study scattering is not only relevant in quantum mechanics. Actually, uh, several authors pointed out that uh, to study the scattering by black holes is relevant to stretch information about the parameters of these black holes. And to study scattering by black holes, we need to study waves in black hole vicinity. And to my knowledge, the first paper to uh, give the basis to study waves in the vicinity of black hole is the Hagen Wheeler paper. But uh, uh, computation of the differential scattering cross section. Um, happens only in 60s, actually in 64, in a PhD thesis of Heldrich. But the most famous paper uh, to start the computations of differential scattering cross-section uh, was the, is the, the Martinet paper from 68. After this work, several techniques were implemented to compute uh, scattering of different uh, fields in different black hole scenarios. Uh, for instance, you have scattering by black holes, uh, charged black holes, rotating black holes, regular black holes, and so on. And today, I'll talk about scattering by deformed black holes. But why to consider deformed black holes? Uh, we are entering in a new era of tests of general relativity. Uh, gravitational waves and the first image of uh, black hole shadow provide new channels to test gravity in the strong field regimes. So general relativity may not be 
the, the final gravity theory, and one can introduce alternative theories of gravity with additional terms to uh, deal with possible issues. But as you know, to find solutions in alternative theories is not the easiest task, and anyone can use parameterized solutions uh, to bypass the, these difficulties. Uh, in, in spirit, these parameterized solutions are uh, very similar to post-Newtonian parameterized solutions, but these parameterized black holes are valid in the world space-time outside uh, the event horizon. So we can consider the near horizon uh, region to study strong field regime. And along the years, several parameterizations were introduced. In, and today, we will consider in particular this parameterization uh, given, given by Johansen and Sautis, uh defined by this line element where H is the deformation function and epsilon M are the deformation parameters that when all these parameters vanish, we cover the, the Shivasho uh, space time. Uh, it's important to point out that uh, the event horizon of the Johansen Sautis black hole uh, is the same of the Shivasho space time regardless of the deformation parameters. So the area of the Johansen Psalchis black holes are the same of Shivasho. And we can constrain the Johansen Psalchis parameters to have the same post Newtonian asymptotic of Shivasho, and we'll do this later. So we want to study scattering of particles and fields in, in this uh, black hole uh, background. And we will start by analyzing the, the scattering of particles. So we need to, to obtain the trajectories in this space time. Here you have the, the geodesic equation in this space time. K is equal 1 for massive particles and equal 0 for massless particles. And in this work, we consider only massless particles because uh, they play an, an important role in the econo uh, limit of the scalar scattering. Well, due to the killing uh, vectors associated to uh, this space time, we have two conservative quantities along the geodesic. Uh, one of them related to the energy and the other with the angular momentum. And we can uh, substitute these conservative quantities in the uh, geodesic equation to obtain a, an expression in the equatorial plane for the orbit, orbit equation. Um, here, B is the impact parameter, and in the next slide, I will show where it is. Uh, we can derive this equation again and obtain this expression that can be used to determine the, the trajectories um, in this space time with suitable boundary conditions. But this equation can also be used to obtain the location of the light rings, um, basically by vanishing these two derivatives and solving this equation. And as this space time is static and circularly symmetric, uh, the light ring location determines the shadow of the black hole. Uh, here we have a schematic representation of what is going on. We have a trajectory, and here we have uh, the scattered body, the parameterized black hole. Here we have the impact parameter and the closest radius. Uh, this capital theta here are the total deflection angle. Uh, due to the light rings, we have a critical impact parameter. So for a, a smaller value of impact parameter, the trajectories are absorbed by the black hole. And for a bigger value, we, the, the trajectories are uh, scattered by the black hole. We can obtain an expression for the total deflection angle in terms of the impact parameter uh, by integrating the orbit equation and we obtain uh, this expression here. Uh, and we can now to write an expression for the classical differential scattering perception uh, in terms of the scattering angle that is related to the total deflection angle by this relation, where this n here represents the number of loops that the uh, trajectory undergoes before uh, being scattered. So later I will show some results using uh, these quantities here, but we are not only interested in to study scattering of particles, we also want to study scattering of fields. And to do so, we'll consider that we have a uh, massless scalar field in this uh, black hole background. Uh, and this uh, scalar field doesn't change the background. So basically we need to solve uh, 
uh, the massless Klein Gordon equation. And due to spherical symmetry, we can decompose the, the scalar field as given by this expression. And substituting this uh, decomposition, we obtain this Schrodinger like equation. Here, V is the effective potential. And uh, as we can see, the dependence on the deformation parameters appear multiplied by L, L plus one. So when L is equal to zero, uh, the solutions of the Schrodinger like equation uh, are the same of the Schwarzschild, regardless of the uh, deformation parameter. Uh, this plays an important role in the low frequency uh, regime of total absorption per section. Uh, here we want to study the scattering process. So we will consider uh, standard scattering boundary conditions. Uh, at infinity, we have a composition of ingoing and outgoing waves. And at uh, the event horizon, we have purely incoming waves. Uh, R and T here are related to the reflection and transmission coefficients and satisfy this flux conservation relation. Uh, here we have a, a representation of the problem. We have a uh, ingoing wave. This wave will interact with the scattering potential. Uh, part of this wave will be absorbed by the black hole and part will uh, be scattered back to infinity. Uh, today I'll talk about this scattered part, but if you uh, want, you can check the absorbed part in this previous paper from us. Uh, as I said, we can write an expression for the differential scattering cross-section in terms of the scattering amplitude. And using the virtual wave approach, we can write an uh, expression for the scattering amplitude in terms of the um, reflection coefficients given by this expression here. Uh, now we have an equation to compute uh, numerically the differential scattering cross-section, but uh, it's not too simple because this, this scattering amplitude uh, has a lack of convergence in the forward direction, uh, basically small values of, of theta. Uh, but we can use some techniques to improve the convergence of the series. Uh, in our paper, we use a uh, series reduction method. Uh, okay, so now we have this expression for the differential scattering cross-section when we can analyze it in some uh, regions. Uh, we'll see that in the forward direction, uh, the differential scattering cross-section uh, of the scalar field uh, can be approximated by the classical differential scattering cross-section. And in the backward direction, namely theta equal pi, uh, some, several authors pointed out that uh, just as in objects, a bright spot or halo appears, basically a uh, intensity peak in the theta equal pi. So this is an effect called glory, and we can approximate the differential scattering cross-section by uh, this expression here, that is the glory scattering approximation. Uh, BG is the uh, glory impact parameter. So uh, let's move on to our results. Today we'll consider this parameterization, a uh, static Johansen Plautius black hole with only one additional parameter uh, given by this epsilon. And here we plot the, uh, we plot some geodesics in, uh, of this uh, parameterized black holes. Here we fixed the value of the impact parameter to be equal to 5.2 5.2 m, and we changed the value of the deformation parameter. We noticed that as we increase the value of the deformation parameter, uh, the influence of the black hole on the trajectories diminishes. Uh, in this figure, we noticed that the only uh, trajectory that is absorbed is for epsilon equal minus five. So to diminish the value of the to diminish the value of the deformation parameter uh, intensifies the, the gravity attraction of this uh, black hole. Uh, here we plot some results of the classical uh, scattering. In the left panel, we plot the total deflection angle as a function of the closest radius. Uh, the vertical asymptotes here are the uh, light ring location. Uh, and we, we noticed that as we increase the value of the deformation parameter, the light ring location uh, diminishes. So to increase the value of the deformation parameter uh, diminishes the value of the shadow of the black hole. Regardless, uh, it's uh, event horizon area because the, the area of these black holes are the same of Shivashi. Uh, additionally, as we, as we approach the 
uh, as we approach the light ring location, uh, the geodesics can be scattered through any angle. Uh, in the right panel, we plot the differential scattering cross section uh, of Johansen Psalti's black holes compared with the Shivashud case. The Shivashud case is, is this black line here. And we noticed that in the moderate to high uh, scattering angles, to increase the value of the deformation parameter also increases the value of the differential scattering cross section. And before we move for uh, the scalar scattering, it is interesting to uh, analyze the glory scattering to, some, to get some intuition about uh, what we'll see. So here we have the glory scattering parameters. Uh, and we notice that when we increase the value of the deformation parameter, the glory uh, impact parameter diminishes. And recalling the equation for the, the glory scattering, uh, we, we have that the argument of the Bessel function is proportional to omega bg. So the interference fringe width that will appear uh, are proportional to 1 over omega bg. So uh, as we increase the value of the deformation parameter, the interference fringe width uh, gets larger, as we'll see. Uh, here we plot the differential scattering cross section. Uh, using the partial wave approach, we have this uh, oscillatory behavior. Uh, in the forward direction, we noticed that we can approximate the differential scattering cross-section by the geodesic scattering cross-section. Uh, and in the backward direction, we have an intensity peak that can be approximated by the glory uh, approximation. Use it to smaller values of the scattering angle. Uh, Using the, the glory approximation, we can understand why we have this oscillatory behavior here. Basically, we have uh, trajectories with uh, the trajectories that are propagating different senses, and this interferes. Uh, what happens if we fix the value of the frequency and change the value of the deformation parameter? Well, we notice that when we increase the value of the deformation parameter, the interference fringe width uh, gets larger. And when we decrease the value of the deformation parameter, the inter interference fringe width gets uh, narrower. Uh, the same happens if we fix the value of the deformation parameter and change the value of the frequency. To change the, the value of the frequency, uh, to, to increase the value of the frequency, uh, get the interference uh, fringe width uh, narrower, as, as we can see here. Uh, as I said, to change uh, the deformation parameter uh, influences in the intensity peak of the uh, in the theta equal pi. So we can compare this with the glory uh, with the glory approximation, and we will be saying that the numerical result oscillates around the glory approximation. So uh, yeah, glory can be used, but to to have a, a better uh, a better result in the in the uh, theta equal pi, we need to consider numerical results. Uh, and here we have our final remarks. We presented the main equations to study the scattering uh, process via the geodesic analysis, glory approximation, partial wave approach, and we also studied the role of the deformation parameter in the scattering process. Uh, in the forward direction, the effects of the deformation parameter are less relevant, and our numerical results for differential scattering cross section are well approximated by the classical differential scattering cross section. In the moderate to high scattering angles, we notice that a remarkable interference pattern appears due to trajectories propagating different senses. And in the backward direction, we have that we have that the deformation parameter has a, a is, is relevant and we can approximate our results with the glory semi-classical scattering. Uh, we conclude that uh, the scattering fringes get narrower for smaller values of the deformation parameter. And what to do now? Well, we know that uh, astrophysical black holes uh, has have no no zero non-zero angular momentum. So uh, a possible extension to this work is to consider uh, the rotating versions of parameterized black holes and to understand how uh, the deformation parameter together with the 
uh, non-zero angular moment to change the the scattering process. So thank you. Thank you, Renan, <coughs> for your talk. Um, well, it's time for questions. Is anybody in the audience in general that wants to ask anything? Not in the room. Not in the room, okay. Uh, I don't see anyone in the chat. No, but uh, I want to ask you something, yes. I mean, yes, okay. if you have some idea. Um, let me see, uh, what was the question? Yes, the, you compare geodesics with the parcel waves, and the glory effect. And uh, let me see if I understand correctly. When the, uh, when the parcel waves, when you consider the, the infinite frequency uh, limit, you should recover the geodesics, right? Yes, yes, the economic limit, yeah. Econo, exactly. So uh, are you able to check that numerically? If you increase uh, very high frequencies, yeah, I I I didn't try to increase the frequency to uh, huge values of uh, uh, beyond five. I, I I didn't try, but and I don't know if uh, numerically it is um, viable because I mean some uh, of that frequency. Is yeah, yeah, I I don't know. Uh, because uh, when we increase the value of the frequency, we need to consider uh, more uh, L numbers, uh, these part yeah. wave numbers, basically. And yeah. when we increase yeah. these numbers here, we the, the computation is is so slow. It's very very slow. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, because I wanted to see uh, what happens. You know, I've been playing with the. Um, with the shadows of black holes and these things yes. so you are uh, essentially you are tracing geodesics okay but yeah. if, if you consider uh, waves that uh, since the waves have some finite frequency a uh, wavelength yeah yes then uh, the the critical curve the light ring or the, the critical curve is point like but if you have a, a wave with a certain uh, width so i guess that there must be some funny uh, oscillatory pattern in these if you had an ideal, uh, you know, uh, disk, thin disk, and you could uh, consider the scattering problem with this thin disk, with that interaction. I, I'm curious to see how the finite size of the non-zero, non-zero size of the waves uh, mm -hmm. could uh, manifest in, in, the, in, in the shadow. Yeah, yeah and, actually, actually, if we consider the, the Absorption process is more easy to to uh, compare with the the shadow. Actually, uh, if we plot the the absorption cross section uh, in the, we can see that in the uh, high frequency regime, uh, the total absorption cross section oscillates around the the classical absorption yeah, cross section. Yeah. That is the the shadow of the black hole, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how to go from there? To the to a map or an image of the shadow, you know, made with parcel waves is something I don't yet uh, I don't have clear. So I don't know if you have thought about that. I I I didn't actually, but okay. So maybe we can think about this. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. So let's thank again, uh, Renan. <laughs> thank you. May I may I comment? Uh, so I have raised my hand. Ah, sorry, I didn't. I was okay. Involved. Okay, please go ahead. No problem. So uh, there are many interesting effects to be considered while uh, thinking about even the shadow. But uh, Hannah, if you can come back to exactly that uh, transparency that you were. That's like yeah. So uh, let's go by parts, right? So the first thing is that when you uh, so when you see this plot, for instance, so uh, you see that what is the solid line in the background is the classical result, right? And so uh, these oscillations that you have are just the 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 contribution. I mean, from the wave character of the scattering, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, what you can do. So first, uh, you can go to this. Uh, 
particle limit, and then you get this this non-wavy line, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what what is the other result that is in this plot is the glory approximation, is that you assume like op optics, right? And then you get this uh, red result that is shown there, that is close to the backward direction, is what you see when you look. So if you throw a wave and what you get yeah, back from back. it, and then you get the, this oscillatory uh, 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 pattern, right? So, and there are mainly two numerical difficulties. You asked about one, that is to raise the frequency unlimitedly. So normally we use M omega. In this plot is three, we use one, we use two, we use five. Mm -hmm. But either when we get to higher values like 10, 20, you get some numerical difficulties, but also when you lower it too much, because it, you may also be interested, that there may be interesting features that come from the low energy scattering, right? And and this also introduces some numerical difficulties. But already, I mean, we, we so we are facing difficulties and try to overcome them along the way. Also, and, and then what Hannah has mentioned is this series reduction problem, right? That is useful. Uh, and, and it may be some similar, what I mean is that we may use some similar strategy, numerical strategy, to overcome this problem for very high frequencies. But you are right about, uh, I mean, uh, it's interesting to observe, right, many uh, wave effects in the shadow. Obviously now is something that uh, we may investigate theoretically, but we are very far away experimentally, right, to uh, observe some, some, some uh, effects like that, right? If you, we are around a 10%, uh, how can I say, uh, yeah. Uh, experimental error, so it's going to be very difficult. But it's, this is something that we can do, obviously. Uh, not, I, I, I don't mean only the, the numerical uh, uh, approach, but also the theoretical approach to consider couplings, for instance, between the helicity of the field and the spin of the black hole. You know, there, there are many, many very interesting effects that are going to appear when we consider the wave nature right, of the light that has been scattered. But, I mean, uh, it's still a long road to go. I think we can go, but, I mean, uh, we have to decide. I mean, so we, since we are so far from, I mean, like to uh, yeah, see exactly. it experimentally, I mean, we have to, but it's very interesting, although a lot of work, theoretical work, theoretical studies to be implemented. Thank you very much for your very nice question. Thank you for uh, your welcome. comments, yes. Okay, so it's, if there are no further comments, um, then I think we can move to the next speaker. Uh, Zeus, let me, uh, I cannot make you from here, but I can go to the other place. Just to see if I can upgrade you to presenter. Okay, now you're a presenter, very good. So I come back to my computer. Okay, so whenever you want, you can share your screen. And um, okay, hello, Zeus. Can you share your slides? We, we, I cannot hear you. Are you speaking? No. Okay. Try now. Try now. Not yet. No, we have some problem. <laughs> Now I hear something. No, no, it went away. Just for a second. Maybe the cable try to disconnect and connect again, the jack. Ah, no. Zeus, let me ask you one thing. So do you see the, the, the microphone blue in your computer? I see. Blue. As a last uh, possibility, just remove your phone. Right? And try to speak without the, the, you already did that. So insert it again. <laughs> well, maybe leave the session and start again. Sometimes you need to allow the, the system. And when you re-enter the session, choose the option to speak yeah, instead no, of. He has the microphone, so he did the right choice, but I don't know what, what what's wrong what's wrong oh you know gonzalo when i enter uh, uh you can choose the the muted or unmuted option to get in i think yeah 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 i know but he has the microphone and it's open so it should be working 
Okay. So let's see. You are now muted. Okay. No, you are still presenter. So can you say something? No, it's not working. You say hello. I can read your lips, but. <laughs> okay, I don't know, maybe. Do we have another speaker afterwards? I don't know. Uh, I don't have the schedule here. Uh, Gonzalo, he's the, he's the last one of the morning session. Okay, so we can wait. No problem. Can you hear me? Uh, perfect. Perfect. I had to go out of the room and and enter again okay very good so let's try to start again uh, share your screen your slides okay okay your camera is there okay very good i hope you can already see my, my screen right yes Okay, should I start? Uh, well, uh, give me a minute. Uh, so our next speaker, <laughs> after so many <laughs> difficulties, is Zeus Moreira, uh, who is also a student, a PhD student from the University Federal of, of Pará, Federal University of Pará in Belém. And uh, his supervisor is Luis Quispino, and he's also collaborating with uh, Rafael Bernat. So Zeus, uh, whenever you are ready, please go ahead. Yeah. I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, today I will present a work that I've done uh, together with Professor Rafael Bernat and Professor Luis Crispino. That is called uh, Singleton uh, Geodesic Singleton Radiation in Black Hole Space Times Analytical Investigation. And so here uh, we have a brief summary of my presentation. I will start in, with an introduction, some motivation. And uh, in the second section, I will talk about the work itself that is about scalar radiation in short space time. And then I will end up with some conclusions. Uh, so uh, I think we can start with the introduction. So I think a good place to start is to talk about the first calculations involving uh, geodesic radiation in black hole space times. And one of the first works on this topic is was done by Davis and other collaborators uh, where, they, uh, where they calculate uh, the radiation emitted by a scalar particle that is radially falling into a Schwarzschild black hole. And not much later we had uh, plenty of works uh, calculating the, the radiation emitted by a scalar particle that is for, in a circular orbit of a Schwarzschild black, black hole, which leads to the singleton radiation, uh, what, which we are interested in. And why exactly uh, should we start, should we study uh, scalar uh, singleton radiation? 
well first of all the scale of field uh is uh is very is much more easy to manipulate mathematically compared to fields with higher spin and but moreover uh, the scale of fields can be used as a model of more general radiation emission processes for instance uh, some decades ago we had some uh, supposed gravitational wave detection in a paper by Verber. And although this detection later on was proven to be wrong, uh, many physicists at that time uh, investigated the Verber results uh, using scalar field models. So although scalar radiation and gravitational radiation are different types of problems, and the different polariz polarizations of the field leads to different types of spectra at the first approximation the scalar fields can be useful uh, and with that in mind uh, our group uh, has already worked on this topic very extensively and just to see a few papers uh, to contextualize uh, the techniques that we usually apply uh, we, we, the group works mainly with the approach of quantum field theory in curved space times, uh, together with, uh, numerical techniques, uh, to solve the, the corresponding equations. And, um, yeah, here is a paper by Professor Crispino and other collaborators where they calculate the singleton radiation, uh, of a source rotating around a Schwarzschild black hole. And there are other works as well, uh, calculating the, the gravitational waves emitted by a particle orbiting a Schwarzschild black hole. And also um, in more involved space times, uh, like the singleton radiation in the curved space time. And finally, uh, uh, the, the work that we managed to publish this year uh, we again pretty much solved the well, one of the problems that are already presented to you we calculate the radiation emitted by a particle that is revolving around the Schwarzschild black hole but now uh, instead of using numerical techniques uh, we try to apply some analytical calculations uh, namely we use the theory of high functions and um, yeah, just a brief recap on high functions. And here in equation one, we have the what is the so-called Hoyne equation. Uh, and this is a linear ordinary differential equation with four regular singularities. Namely, uh, the singularities are uh, z equals zero, one, a, and infinity. And yeah, and you also have to satisfy this constraint over here. Uh, but this uh, is not this equation exactly that I will use in our work. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the equation that appears in the in the case of the scalar field in the Schwarzschild space time is the confluence case of the Hoyne equation. That is equation number two. Uh, or simply the confluent Hoyne equation. And you can reach the equation uh, two uh, from the equation from the equation one by means of a confluence process. A confluence process uh, is when you merge two singularities of the equation together. And so to, to get equation two from equation one, we have to take the singularity z equals a, and you take a uh, to infinity, and then and then we will end up, you end up with three singularities. The two previous one, as z equals one and z and z equals zero, remain regular. But now, because of the confluence process, the singularity at infinity is now irregular. And the 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 equations of the Hoyne class describe many physical phenomena, uh, such as in the quantum mechanics or or even here in black hole physics and that is uh, very interesting to investigate um, their properties so now uh, we may go to the work itself that is about scale radiation Schwarzschild space time 
Right, so since uh, we want to calculate the scalar radiation, uh, we should uh, consider a Lagrangian. Uh, here we consider a mass layer scalar field, a Lagrangian of a scalar field, and here we consider a mass layer scalar field. And we can calculate the corresponding equations of motion, or should I say the, field, the corresponding field equation, and uh, it's given here in equation force, the so-called Klein-Gordon equation. And if we consider uh, the space of solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation, uh, we can define uh, the Klein-Gordon inner prog product according to equation five. Uh, for we can define we can only define this inner product by globally hyperbolic space times. So for each uh, two solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation, phi two, phi one, and phi two. Uh, we associate this complex number defined by this integral, which is evaluated over Cauchy surface. That's why you have to require that the spacetime is globally hyperbolic. Uh, since I already spoiled that we will work in the, with the Schwarzschild spacetime, um, we will basically quantize this field uh, in the outside region of Schwarzschild, which we know that is globally hyperbolic, and hence this inner pro product is always well defined. Right, so here we have uh, the line elements of Schwarzschild spacetime. And in the outside region of uh, Schwarzschild spacetime, uh, there exists a time like healing vector associated with time translation symmetry. And therefore, we can consider uh, positive frequency modes according to equation seven, where here, y of theta phi are the spherical harmonics. And this indice n um, can take two values uh, that I called uh, right arrow and left arrow. The right arrow index uh, is associated with modes that came from the past horizon, and the left arrow is associated with modes that came from the past no infinity. There is another nomenclature that is very that is pretty common common in the literature that is to call this uh, the up and in modes respectively. Uh, the, so we can substitute the, this form of the modes into the Klein-Gordon equation and we'll obtain the, this radio equation given here in equation eight, where V is an effective potential. Uh, and yeah, this, this effective potential uh, have a very characteristic uh, behavior. So it vanishes uh, at the horizon and at the infinity. Uh, and the, the radio equation and these regimes uh, simplifies a lot. So uh, we can uh, look for the asymptotic behavior of the, of the radio modes and they are described by equation 10 and 11, um, where here, I have introduced this new radio coordinate that is called the Tortoise coordinate. And uh, we also have introduced this, uh, a couple of constants. So here this A is our normalization constant that can be uh, calculated uh, with the aid of the Klein-Gordon in a product. And uh, these R and T are related to the reflection and transmission coefficient respectively. So, um, here uh, we have a representation of the right arrow and left arrow modes uh, in a Penrose diagram. So, for instance, the left arrow modes or the up modes, they came from the past horizon. They interact with the effective potential and um, part of the modes are transmitted to the, the future infinity, the future no infinity, and the other part is reflected back to the horizon. And similarly, uh, the in modes or the left arrow modes uh, came from the past infinity, interact with the potential. Some of them are transmitted and some of them are reflected back. Right, so now we may proceed with the canonical quantization of the field, the scalar field, and the set that the, the set of positive and negative frequency modes forms a complete set of functions. So we may expand our field in terms of positive and negative frequency modes. 
And these new operators, A and A dagger, uh, are the usual annihilation and creation operators, uh, which satisfies the typical uh, commutation relation here in equation 13. Um, yeah, and since the the set of modes that you are dealing with are a complete set, they must be orthonormal set, orthonormal set, and this is given here in equation 14. And we can also use the Klein-Gordon inner product to calculate uh, our normalization constant is given here in equation 15. Uh, so now uh, we may consider the the current that describes the scalar charge that is orbiting the black hole. So the this current couples to the scalar field through this constant Q. And uh, yeah, it's localized at a pixel radius capital R. It's in the equatorial plane, plane and it revolves uh, around the black hole with, with uh, angular velocity capital omega. And we can calculate the emission amplitude of a particle uh, being emitted uh, with quantum numbers n omega l m and with the emission amplitude in our hands uh, it's a pretty straightforward calculation uh, to calculate the corresponding emitted power and the emitted the expression for the emitted power is given here in equation 18 and we can see that the emitted power uh, depends directly on the form of the radio modes. So we need to solve the radio equation uh, in order to evaluate this quantity. So uh, the radio equation um, can be cast actually in, by a suitable transformation, you can transform the radio equation of the scalar field in short space time into the canonical form of the confluent Hoyne equation. So the corresponding solutions are given in terms of confluent Hoyne functions, which here are denoted by this Hoyne C in equation 19. And all these new indices, Q alpha, delta gamma, and epsilon, uh, they are defined here in equations 20 to 24. And now uh, we present some consistency checks between our analytical results and some numerical results are very present in the literature. Uh, so uh, here it plots the absolute value of the radio modes uh, with, with respect to the radio coordinate for different, for different values of the frequency and for L fixed equals to one. And here on the left, uh, we consider the, the left arrow modes uh, or the in modes and you, here over the right, we consider the right arrow modes or the up modes. And as you can see, the numerical and analytical calculations are in very good agreement. Uh, and here uh, we calculate the emitted power as a function of the, of the particle angular velocity. And again, the left panel is associated with left arrow modes and here right arrow modes. Uh, we consider L equals to M equals to one, two, and three. And again, uh, pretty much the numerical analytical result yields to the same result. Now, uh, uh, interesting particular case to analyze is the low frequency limit. And to investigate the regime of low frequency, we just have to take our uh, radio your, our general analytical solution of the radio equation given uh, back then back there for for equation 19 and set the frequency to zero and we obtain this expression here in equation uh, in equation 25 and some very intriguing happens uh, because previously uh, we had two linear independent confluent time functions uh, that combines together to form the solution however when you put the frequency to zero these two linear independent uh, Hoyne functions uh, degenerate into a single one confluent Hoyne function, as you can see here in equation 25. And this is due to the fact that the 
characteristic exponents of the confluent Hall equation are zero and minus four i m omega. And in order to have two linear independent Frobenius solutions, the difference between these two characteristic exponents cannot be an integer number. Uh, however, when the frequency goes to zero, this difference goes to zero as well. So the linear independence is lost. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are several ways to find a second solution when you already know uh, a first solution of a linear differential equation. And here we choose a method where we analyze the confluent Hoyne equation symmetry group. And, uh, but first, it's important to note that the confluent Hoyne functions must satisfy this transformation law given here in equation 26 for any A and B reals. So we may choose A and B to fit our problem. We choose A equals minus L and B equals L plus one. So we get here on the left-hand side, the, the Hoyne function that we had here in equation 25, and you can transform it into this new confluent Hoyne function on the right-hand side of 27. And now we consider the confluent Hoyne equation symmetry group. This is basically a group with 16 elements, uh, which leaves the confluent Hoyne equation invariant. We consider two transfer transformations of this group. The, tr the transformation that is called T1 and the other that is called T4, and they are defined here in 28 and 29. And we need to apply this transformation in a specific order. So we first apply T1, and then we apply T4, and we obtain this new Hoyne function here in the, on the right-hand side of equation 30. And the good news is that this new Hoyne function is now linear in the, uh, form a linear independent pair uh, together with the first one. Uh, so uh, we can express the general analytical result of the radio equation in the low frequency regime as a linear combination of these two. Uh, and we can go even further and look for the relation between confluent time functions and hypergeometric functions. And um, yeah, here, uh, according to equations 32 and 33. And here in equation 32, for instance, this hypergeometric is nothing but the hypergeometric representation of the Legendre function of the first kind. And here at the bottom, uh, this is the Legendre function of the second kind. And this is already a very well-known result in the literature because when you take the radio equation and you set the frequency to zero, you can find a suitable transformation in, uh, that transforms the radio equation into a Legendre equation. Uh, right, so we may go to my final remarks. And here uh, we talk about scale radiation and uh, just a brief summary. Uh, we have obtained, obtained it analytically, the, rad the radiation emitted in terms of confluent time functions. And uh, we presented some consistency checks uh, comparing analytical and numerical results obtaining great agreement between them and uh, uh, we investigated the low frequency limit and something interesting happens because the two previous linear independent high functions uh, degenerate into a single one function when the frequency goes to zero. However, we are able to, to find a linear pair of independent solutions. Sorry, uh, we are able to find a linear independent pair of solutions uh, using the confluent high equation symmetry group. And there are future perspectives on this work as well. Uh, we could explore uh, the theory of fine functions in, on more uh, involved, involved scenarios like uh, more general space time, space time, black holes with rotation, or with, uh, exploring fields with higher spin. And that's all that I prepared for today. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for your talk, Zeus. <clears throat> It's been very, very interesting. Uh, I'm sure that my students uh, would love it because they love these hypergeometric functions and the Hoyne <laughs> generalization is, it looks really great. Yeah. So uh, are there any questions in the, in the audience, in the room first? You can raise your hand if you want. Uh, no, no, any no comments, no complaints, nothing. 
Okay, here in the chat, anybody else who online who wants to comment something? Okay, so me, the, the, you, you can take your time to think. So let me see. Um, you have studied the radiation emitted by a point particle, a scalar point particle orbiting the object. Yeah. The right. black hole. So how is this, uh, is this radiation somehow uh, similar to gravitational radiation? Is the way yeah, it's similar, but uh, there there is a paper where uh, it's compared a paper by Rafael Bernard, Crispino, and I think Atsushi, where they plot all the, the, the corresponding spectra of the, with, of the radiation of fields with spin zero, one, and two. And you can see the difference, but um, yeah, I, I, I argue here in the introduction that you can somehow um, model uh, mm -hmm. some properties using scalar fields. Some, some of the properties are shared by both systems, but of course, uh, there's, the spectra is not the same mm -hmm. uh, because the, you have uh, different uh, polarizations of the field. So it's account for a different kind of spectra. Uh, but the, do you think or have you considered the possibility of addressing those problems uh, for different spins uh, also analytically? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty doable. It's yeah. doable. Okay, no, I don't know if you remember, there was a talk yesterday by Pau Amaro Seoane, who was speaking about uh, uh, gravitational radiation in extreme uh, mass ratio in spirals. Yeah. And th there seems to be a problem when you have uh, something like a brown dwarf orbiting a, a supermassive black hole, that uh, there will be a strong uh, signal to noise ratio, so there will be a, a strong emission for a long time. Mm -hmm. So in order to uh, to filter those emissions, which can completely collapse your detectors in given frequencies, it mm -hmm. is necessary to have a, a good control on the modeling of those uh, waves. So I, I guess I understand that uh, these analytical approximations or analysis that you are doing could be very useful in, in that direction. Yeah. So and related to that, uh, I would like to know if it is possible uh, somehow to uh, to uh, mimic I don't uh, to mimic the back reaction. Okay, and I don't want to model exactly the back reaction, but simply to mimic the back reaction uh, from your uh, current when you define the current of the scalar wave, uh, you assume that the particle is at a fixed radius. Yeah. So, yeah. Maybe you could consider some time dependence in the radius. Okay, uh, you, you you must consider that the particle is emitting gravitational waves, so it's it's losing energy, so the radius is getting smaller and smaller. Exactly. Uh, it's simply that the time scale of that variation should be much smaller than the, than the orbital period, maybe 1,000 times, 1 million times, so that you yeah. can do it adiabatically. So I yeah. guess that you can probably uh, study in that way analytically some secular effects or some uh, to have some control yeah. on those parameters. Yeah, I never, I never uh, read a paper that considered this, this, this radiation emission together with the scalar, with the scalar uh, radiation. Uh, and I'm not quite sure if it is possible to treat exactly this problem uh, analytically. But yeah, it could be an idea to investigate. Why not? Um, I think um, that adiabatically, you know, assuming there's a very slow change in the orbital yeah. uh, radius, uh, you could make some progress in that direction because analytic and numerically, if you consider the problem numerically, you can solve it for several uh, orbits, but not thousands or millions of orbits. Yeah. Okay. So I think it might be very good to use your approach to implement that adiabatic uh, modification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 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 the, cur the charge follows a time-like circular orbit, right? And mm -hmm. there is a region in short to space time, I think, is greater than six m. I'm not quite sure that it, that is the stable orbits of of. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this region, I think you can apply this. Yes, probably. Yes, but the, it would be nice to have a look at that. But anyway, yeah, of course, we'll talk about it sometime. <laughs> of course. Thank okay, you. so anybody else wants to mention comment something? 
because I didn't see that. So Luis, please go ahead. Okay. So uh, thank you, Gonzalo, for your very interesting questions as usual. <laughs> So a uh, lot of work uh, uh, to be done. I mean, uh, mainly, I mean, to adapt this uh, this uh, approach to higher spins, like electromagnetic and gravitational uh, 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 fields, uh, as uh, you and Zeus mentioned. And and the main feature is that because there you have two polarization modes, as Zeus mentioned. So you have twice the radiation emission uh, when compared to the scalar case. So this is one, for instance, one of the features that you have. The other is the, the mode emission, emission mode by mode thing that, I mean, uh, uh, in principle changes, right? When you consider different uh, uh, fields. But uh, it's uh, very interesting, the possibility that you mentioned. I mean, things that numerically are very costly, right? Uh, to implement it uh, with this analytical approach. But it's always, I mean, a matter of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, if it's uh, uh, doable, right? I mean, if the amount of work that you have to, to, to treat the problem analytically, you know, one of the, the, the biggest challenges to solve this uh, was what uh, uh, Zeus mentioned, that those transformations, right? Well, because in, in some situations, I mean, you know, Hoyn functions, as you said, is a, a universe. Right? Almost everything can be solved with Hoyn functions, yeah. right? So, and and this is something that you have to become a bit of an expert, right? I mean, to find uh, the appropriate transformation to deal with each problem that you consider. But certainly, it's worth uh, uh, taking a look carefully in these things that you mentioned. Thank you very much. Thanks for your comments. Okay, so thank you everyone for these, all the speakers for, and everybody that participated in the comments and discussions for this uh, session. And now it's time for a break and we will continue uh, at 3 or I think a bit earlier today at 2.45 and uh, with the last part of the, of the workshop. Okay, hope to see you later. All right. Thank you.